What's up, viewers and listeners? My name is Jay. I'm a registered nutritionist based here in Bristol, working with BJJ enthusiasts across the globe, helping jiu-jitsu practitioners perform to their best ability on the mat, whilst making sure they're not doing anything stupid with their weight cuts. On today's episode, we had Wesley the Immortal merch. He has a black belt under Pedro Bessa, a pro MMA fighter with over 20 pro fights, runs and owns Olympians MMA, has influenced hundreds if not thousands of people in the combat world. Wes was my first instructor and if I'm honest it was a great pleasure to have him on the show. In this podcast we talked about many things, his time at American Top Team, being smashed by Brazilians, his thoughts on training, some weight cutting experiences and also a little stint in the Ultimate Fighter and much much more. Thank you for tuning in and of course if you're not subscribed please click that button and turn on post notifications for further content updates. Thank you for watching and listening and let's get into episode 22. Oos. Right, episode 22, guys, my name is Jay, I'm the host of the BJJ Nutrition Podcast and the BJJ Nutrition Consultancy, where we help jiu-jitsu athletes, hobbyists, whatever you are, to perform best on your mats at, and also not do anything silly with their weight cuts. Today, I'm joined with guest number 22. Wesley Merch. Hey, <laughs> been eager to get you on, buddy, because technically, well, no, you are basically my first ever instructor, professor, all that type of jazz, and um, yeah, obviously that was... Uh, from one of your students who recommended to come down, a massive, obviously, UFC fan myself, and I thought, where to start? And they just simply said, come down to Olympia and see what it's all about. And, uh, yeah, here I am today, obviously, what, three and a bit years later type of thing, still doing the yeah. same thing and starting doing it type of stuff. But, um, yeah, mate, uh, I think I always say to everyone, every time I come down to Olympia, it's probably... Even though the sessions are absolutely great, one of the best thing ever is listening to your stories post <laughs> post Matt. Normally giving shit to Troy at some point as well, yeah. <laughs> and Screech and everyone else type thing. But it's always some sort of story which I'm still like, I swear I've heard them all before. But then something new comes out yeah. of the good work, and I'm like, where's this come from? I was like, right, if I'm enjoying this, and everyone else like viewers and listeners are going to enjoy this. But um, I thought, well, I know there's a lot of history behind you, mate. Do you want to give some sort of background as to where it all started? I know obviously you've got MMA, jiu-jitsu, judo, wrestling, all that type yeah. of jazz. Where did it? Where did it all stem from? You don't want me asking. Um, well, firstly, thanks, mate. Look, I I pride myself on my storytelling. So that's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty good. Um, yeah, so. Like combat sports started for me when I was really young. Like we, I remember when I was a kid, we used to watch like they used, boxing used to be on ITV back in the day. Yeah. We'd watch it with my nan. We'd be like, be like nine, ten, eleven. Me and my brother and uh, I used to always say like, yeah, one day I'm gonna fight. I'm gonna have my own walkout tune and all this sort of stuff. I, just, I was just drawn by the fact of like walking to a ring and fighting. And um, so, but I got in tr I got in a lot of trouble when I was a kid. So uh, <laughs> my mum would never let me box. So she let me do judo when I was like five, six. I did judo for a few years and then um, stopped. Then as I got a bit older, I started to dabble again, back into judo, a bit of grappling and boxing. As soon as okay. I was allowed to box, I'm gonna box. You know? like, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, but I'd, like, I'd had some scraps at school, you know, like when you fight at school and like I knocked a kid out in school when I was young. So people are like, oh, yeah, he boxes, he boxes. I just didn't box. I just like, I loved boxing. I loved, like, fighting, you know, just one of those sort of things that was untrained. And then as I got older, my first proper judo coach, as in someone I really took it serious under, is a guy called James Waif. Okay. Um, represented Barbados in the Olympics, but he got sent to prison for some stuff. Did about 11 years in prison. So when he got sent away, um, I my judo stopped. Okay. But by then, I was already a full-time pro MMA fighter. So come 2001, I think it was, uh, I think UFC 36, when UFC came to the UK, Lee Ramirez fought on it, and uh, Ian Freeman, Mark Weir. And I was watching it at home, and it was me, a girl who I sort of liked, <laughs> <Yeah>. her boyfriend, <laughs> um, yeah. a couple of other people, my sister and stuff, and we were watching it, and I was like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to fight. Like cage, it was cage fighting then, right? There yeah, was no MMA. Yeah. I'm going to fight cage fighting. And he went, yeah, of course you are, you prick. <laughs> and I think I now, I now owe a 22-year career and a loss of brain cells to this guy who stayed with the girl and I didn't get her. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so I was like, like, I had a, I played football at quite a high, le high level as a kid. And when I was 16, I got sort of dropped. And I never played football since that day. Mm. So when I, decided to commit to MMA 
at like 20, I was like, I'm, listen, I'm going to do this. I'm going to be an athlete. I'm going to, so I stopped drinking, stopped smoking. Like I didn't like smoking weed and stuff. You know, yeah. Stopped doing all sorts. No, I didn't smoke it a lot. Just recreation, but I did nothing. I was like, I'm going to be an athlete. That is it. Yeah. So at that time, I was moving gypsies um, with James Thompson, James Waif, <laughs> and a few like other names and stuff. And James Thompson's like, met up and off for one of those cage fats. Could you train me on the ground? Oh, like, no. Are we talking about the same James? I was on Grapple Fest previously. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thompson, yeah. So <laughs> yeah. James Thompson's like, can you help me train? I was like, yeah, of course we can, mate. So like him and I were like almost best mates at that point, do you know what I mean? So, so it's like little alive. That's yeah, I mean. so, him, so he was my main training partner. So really? he had a fight coming up. It wasn't Mark Goddard. It was a fight before Mark Goddard, I think. Um, might have been Mark. I, I can't remember what it was now, his first, his first fight. And uh, so we went training and we used to train in a church in uh, St. Jacob's Wild Road in Bristol. Yeah. A guy called Arthur Meek. We'd go there and we'd do some striking see Kevin O'Egan we'd do a bit of like putting some bits together for MMA and it was just him and I every day just me and him would train I'd spar with him I'd grapple with him I'd drill with him I'd yeah just us every day and that went on for about two and a half years just us two nice. he had a couple of fights and then about three months into my fight he like, I'd get you a fight if you want and I was like yeah yeah sure I'd do this he's like I think you'd be good like your boxing's good and you've got your judo so like, yeah I'll do that sort of thing so he's like oh yeah I've got your fight I was like Oh, oh. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, no, brilliant. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. So I took the fight and I won and everyone was sort of talking about me because it, there was no one to talk about back then, right? Yeah. So I had like a lot of momentum around me, especially in Bristol. And yeah. then um, that was on Ultimate Combat. And then I got off on another fight off the back of that, took that and I won. And I was like, yeah, this is, this is my career. This yeah. is me. I'm a professional athlete. I'm going to dedicate. So then James Thompson and I were just full time, went to like, the States together, trained at American Top Team. I went to Brazil and trained with the Graces and then we started training at Trojan Free Fighters. So yeah. uh, first two people ever to fight at Trojan Free Fighters at, on the card was myself and Ronnie Mann. Um, Ronnie was 16, I, thought, I think. So we fought and uh, then James fought and that's how Trojan Free Fighters started. And uh, <laughs> this guy called Charlie Joseph then. And that was it. That was the start of the career, man. And then from there, it sort of like grew and then um, John Phillips came and joined us Mike Edwards Zal Galesic who's a Croatian guy if you don't know about Zal mate for anyone who's watching <laughs> if UK MMA if you don't know about Zal he's a Croatian guy fought on Pride fought on uh, loads of Japanese shows fought on UK watch Zal's fights fought Sakuraba like fought really? Zal yeah so he came over and trained with us <laughs> Ronnie Mann Matt Sellers like that was it the team sort of started and then it sort of snowballed from there I mean that was my career I was fully locked in that's mental like yeah. out of interest then obviously because you had the judo background and obviously James obviously added I don't know how he labelled it was he more wrestling was that it, James it, had no background James was a <laughs> massive bloke who could who was up for a fight would never back down to anybody um, and then he started doing a bit of wrestling and a bit of grappling just because he was big. Yeah. There was no like jujitsu or judo. Plus a guy that big didn't really want to put a gi on and go and do judo. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. he didn't, he was literally a bit of wrestling and he used to train with um, Saeed and Amir and them guys as well back in mm. the day. Luke, big Luke. And uh, yeah, that was sort of James. There was no like foundation for James at all. Mm. Instead he decided he was going to do MMA and then he sort of put it in from there. No, that's fair enough. And I think, obviously, looking at your sort of history in terms of like the judo background, when did you, again, that whole jiu-jitsu thing not really been around at that mm -hmm. time, where did you reach out for that kind of information? Or was it, again, just what you picked up from seeing other people were doing? Or was a specific part of the travels where you went to America or, the, or Brazil where you started picking it up more on? Or? Yeah, so, um, I, like, I knew quite early on that you can't just be a hard guy or think you're tough and do MMA or cage fighting then. You can't just do that because I'd watch these fights and people were grappling. And I saw like Lee Remedius was a, a grappler really back then. I mean, Valet Tudo, he used to say. Mm. So what is this Valet Tudo stuff? <laughs> so I started looking at it. And then um, in 2003, I went to Brazil for three months and trained at Gracie Baja in Brazil. And once I got there, I was like, Oh, because there, there was a guy called um, Carlos Lemos Jr. Escojega. He actually opened Grace Baja Bath and stuff. And right. So he used to be our coach back in the day at Trojan. So I went and I stayed with his family and stuff in Brazil, 2003, something like that. And then, uh, 2000, yeah, 2003, I think. And uh, so I went there. First day I go in, 
and I just got to walk into a normal class. Nobody knows where I am or anything. I just, so I go into a gi class or whatever, and I see a group of like Brazilians doing no gi over in the corner. So I get through the first session, go back on the evening. It's the same again. Group of Brazilians doing no gi. I'm, so I say to the guys, like, listen, I fight professional MMA in the UK. Really, I want to do no gi. Could I train with those guys? And he was like, man, there's a black belt, man. And I was like... Yeah, would it be all right? And then he's like, Phew. so he went over and spoke to them. So it was um, Babalu. Do you know? remember Babalu Sabral? Yeah. UF, like UFC guy. I think he, ch- he vied for the light heavyweight title back in the day. So like, it's guys who are like high level guys. You know what I mean? And, uh, so they went and said to me in uh, Portuguese, looked over at me, blah, blah, blah. And then he took me over, introduced me and uh, start. Go over, I started rolling. I remember I got subbed about 13 times day one. And uh, I was like, oh, I'm shit at this. I'm never going to be any good. I'm just going to punch the bag tomorrow. And I went back the next day, got subbed, like counting and that. And then um, went back the next day, got subbed. And then one of the Gracies come over and goes to me like, they're like, hey, man. Like, uh, you, when you don't try, you will always lose, man. I'm like, but look, I'm fucking trying. What does this guy mean? Like, he's like, no, man. He said, all the time you defend, defend, defend. You can't win if you defend. And I'm like, you must try. And I was like, fuck, man. Yeah, if I'm if I'm getting sub 13 times, but I'm yeah. defending subs all the time, it's impossible for me to sub someone, right? <laughs> so the next day I went back. I was like, right, I've got a different mindset. I'm going to really go at it now. I'm going to really try and win. I'm going to try and get something. Got subbed about 14 times. Got, <laughs> got worse from here. So, like, so uh, but it, something had clicked in my head. Mm. And I was like, you can't defend, you can't like win defending. Yeah. And I was like, I'll learn how to defend whilst people are attacking me. Mm. If I'm never attacking anybody, they've got no reason to defend anything. They can implement their game. And I spend six minutes defending somebody else's yeah. jiu-jitsu game. And I'm like, this doesn't make sense. So then by the end of like three weeks or something, I was getting better. I could feel it. Like I, I was trickier to sub. I was moving yeah. around the body better. And it was because like, even when I was in someone's guard, I wasn't trying to not get armbarred. I was trying to pass the guard. And so I was like, yeah, this is, it's clicked for me. Mm. So yeah, I was just like, for me, it was more of an immersion. I was thrown in the deep end by choice as well. And I'm not saying it's the way to go about things now, but back then we didn't have a choice. So I was in Brazil that was where the best jiu-jitsu was. I trained as hard as I could with the guys I could train with, and it helped, really. Did the judo help at all? Massively. Like, my top game was really tricky um, because I could hold people. Now, I wasn't necessarily good at submitting people. Um, I had a couple of little things, you know what I mean, but I could hold people down. Like, if, if I got, like, a Kessie Gatami on people... Um, I would hold them, you know, like side control, scarf holds. Like that was where, unless you were a decent level, purple butt or above, I I could put you in trouble, which meant I could grind and pound you, which was good. But if you were a decent jiu-jitsu player, you know, like purple belts and above, you were escaping. But yeah, guys my level, I could really do well at side control, you know. How was the stand-up over there? Because again, obviously, not to take the stigma of like jiu-jitsu in Brazil was like, all right, we all pull guard, we just sit there, we do our own thing type thing. Yeah. How did that go sort of taking over that duo stand-up? And again, I know you've obviously got a lot of wrestling behind you as well. Yeah. How did that stand with the Nogi guys in Brazil at the time? Did it do well? Or So my wrestling was always quite a good level because James used to, James Wafe used to wrestle. So I'd wrestled with Amir and Saeed, like Saeed's dad, and yeah. Josh, who's a, I was, I attribute him as being my wrestling coach. Um, so my wrestling was always okay, you know. I wouldn't say good, but like for that, for back then, it was decent. And then, uh, so I could do okay, but like these guys would spawn catch stuff on you. Do you know what I mean, front headlocks and stuff because they were decent guys. But if people engage with me, I could throw people quite easily. Yeah. So that was back then. Hip throws and stuff were quite easy. There was a guy back in the UFC in the day called Carl Parisian. Okay. Now he was a judo guy, and he'd throw lots of people. Because that's what MMA was a bit like. People relied on double legs or single legs. So if you had good judo, you could hit through people. Yeah. And I hit through a few people. Um, I wouldn't say nobody was looking at me thinking, wow, no, that guy's a stat. Nothing like that. But I could catch people, even black belts. If black belts would overcommit on the shot, I could throw them. Or I could foot sweep them. 
like they'd clinch with me and I'd catch a foot sweep or mm. a little trip and I would catch people a lot with that. I would say you would look at me and you'd say I was probably a purple belt in stand up and a real white belt in grappling, you know? <laughs> That's interesting. I think where we look at some of the big names at the moment, obviously Owen Livesey comes to mind obviously yeah. with his judo background and stuff and obviously he performed on Quintet and got some nice little foot sweets and I know he tried to judo throw Nicky Rod but he just bum rushed him a bit <laughs> yeah. too quickly. Yeah. Um do you think like judo is going to make a sort of not say a comeback as if it's gone anything, but again, like where jiu jitsu has a bit of a boom type thing? Do you think where I don't know when Nicky Rock came on the scene, was like oh wrestling, 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 and then obviously you had the leg lock crew came in, and obviously did that with Lock and Giles, all that type of jazz. Do you think there's going to be like a wave of kind of like judo guys coming through eventually, or no? I think judo's probably ruined because of the Olympics as well now. Really, yeah, because of the wrestling, they took out no leg grabs, so everything's froze, big froze which is awesome, and then now jiu-jitsu guys who have got half-decent throws will dominate on the ground, so judo's got to do one of two things, really. They've got to embrace the grappling side of it, or, which I fear may happen, they'll put some more rule changes in to, to level it back out towards the judo guys, Yeah. because judo guys just aren't getting any recognition compared to like jiu-jitsu guys. Mm. Jiu-jitsu guys are becoming millionaires, off of grappling, do you know what I mean? Or, yeah. you know, at least a really decent Good, living. Yeah. And there's judo guys who probably train harder. Like, judo's brutal. Like, brutal. The gi's twice the thickness. You're pulling someone around all day by... It's brutal training. And when you go to Japan or somewhere and train, or, like, one of the high-level clubs in the UK or somewhere, the intensity of judo training is really high. Um, I don't think that... I think judo's sort of lost and it has to just remain an, an Olympic sport. Yeah. I think it's one of those things like pro boxing doesn't impact uh, amateur boxing because they're different sports really. Yeah. You know what I mean, so I think uh, I think what you I think what's gonna happen is more people in the jiu jitsu world more judo will come into the jiu jitsu world and it'll start coming in, but until you start really valuing throws and takedowns mm. It's not really going to... I think jiu-jitsu's biggest problem at the moment is no gi, right? So, <laughs> because people are like... Because there's this thing of gi or no gi, gi or no gi, people end up doing one or the other instead of like, oh, it's both. both yeah. Let's just do both and embrace both and see what they are. So, yeah, I think ju judo... I think you'll get more people who adopt a bit of judo, but they'll learn it from jiu-jitsu guys. Yeah. I don't think jiu-jitsu guys are going to judo clubs to learn their judo. So you get an okay level of judo in jiu-jitsu yeah. and you get a high level of jiu-jitsu in judo if that makes sense yeah. if you wanted to be a good like in a jiu-jitsu confessor or grappler with adcc trials on at the moment do you think it would be worth people doing a stint in a, like a pure judo type of environment do you think it would level their game up that much more i or? think everybody should do some judo um go to a judo club for a few definitely because if it's another facet to your game right so it's like it's like i don't consider myself a jiu-jitsu player Days all the time. I'm a grappler, yeah. like a submission grappler, right? Um, now, I think you're an idiot if you do no gi and you don't do any catch wrestling, or mm. you don't do any wrestling, or you don't. You're a fool. Like, but you're just going to rely on your jujitsu. Well, that's all very well. But then you've got people like Eric Paulson who are teaching people like horrible neck cranky <laughs> stuff. ADCC don't care about your IBJJF rules. You know what I mean, so you're an idiot if you don't embrace that. And if you're going to do gi jujitsu and you're going to ignore possibly the best stand-up uh, gi um, format that you can have, judo, you're an idiot. Like One final sponsor shout out to the team at Inner Chimp. Inner Chimp is a brand name that really speaks to grapplers and fighters, one we can believe and relate to on a personal level. Inner Chimp is simply catchy, right? And with small tweaks can be your general gym wear and casual wear and rash guards like this for men, women, and children. Inner Chimp is ethically produced and has turned down cheaper production overseas to ensure this understanding that we only have one earth right which we need to look after this is at the forefront of their production decisions and we want you our listeners and viewers to have a sense of accomplishment in knowing that you are doing your part when buying their products inner chimp tees are 100 percent organic cotton their packaging 80 percent recycled cardboard and all of their products are designed to last their production and manufacturing is in the uk 
trying and aiming to be as eco-friendly as possible, leaving close to zero global footprint. But to put it simply, Innerchimp has a massive passion for the sport, attention to detail and our planet in mind, and always at the forefront of your own Innerchimp. Go check out their website, www.inner-chimp.co.uk, or go check out their Instagram at inner underscore chimp. Thank you for your time. Girl, like, so Pedro, James Wave said to me the other day, he said, mate, can you remember teaching Pedro at the old Bristol... You know, I was like, no. He said, when you used to teach up there, he said, 100% used to teach him. He said, because he used to come to the class on a Sunday and a Wednesday. He said, and you used to cover on the Wednesday. He said, you used to... I can remember, like, back in the day, Pedro would go to, ju to judo classes. Now, Pedro's an amazing jiu-jitsu player, especially in a gi. He's an amazing jiu-jitsu player. And he was going and adding judo into his game. We're talking 2008 or something, you know? Wow. Like, yeah, a long time ago. And yeah. he's coming and he's doing judo, you know? So... I think you're an idiot if you're going to do any sort of grappling and ignore any of the other grappling martial arts. Like, mm. I mean, bear, take, let's take out Aikido or something. But <laughs> Muk Dojo. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but if you're going to do any grappling, to ignore any of the other grappling elements without trying them in your game, I think is naive, you know? Like, mm. they're there. Judo has been around for thousands of years for a reason. Like, it yeah. works, right? It's not a... It's not Aikido. It's not like one of these touch martial arts. It's a legitimate martial art. And if you want to put throws in your game... Get rolled. Yeah, look, I mean, it, it's, you don't... Now that there's leg locks in the game, you don't ignore leg locks, right? Everyone's mm. embracing leg locks because you're going to get your legs pulled off. Yeah. Like, if throwing is part of the game, which it now is, takedown is a massive part of the game now, go to the best place. It's like, you don't do nogi without doing wrestling because mm. you're going to get splattered by a wrestler. I mean, Owen's got amazing wrestling, right? really good wrestling. And his, his wrestling's really good because it's judo oriented as well. But you see that lovely, lovely low single that Nicky hit on him on the stand-up? Mm. Because he's a amazing, Nicky's a brilliant wrestler, right? Yeah. That little trick, boom. And he can catch someone like Owen with that where no one else does because he's got that heavier wrestling. So if you're not going to add wrestling in your game, because you think, oh, no, I've got it covered because I do a bit of jit judo, I do a bit of jits, I do a bit... You're an idiot. Embrace it all. It's a multifaceted sort of whole dimension of it type of thing. Right? I think that... So I think, personally, ju uh, MMA has added that to jiu-jitsu, to grappling now, to jiu-jitsu. Um, because there was always catch wrestling. It's yeah. been around for years and years, right? Like, uh, was it Snake Pit here? Yeah. We got, uh, like, Eric... I trained with Eric Paulson years ago. Years yeah. and years ago. And... Uh, it's been around for ages. We've got Nogi Jiu-Jitsu and we've got Jiu-Jitsu. And now I think because lots of people were doing grappling for MMA, people start to embrace the horrible stuff, like the catch. So that's filtered his way in because mm. more people were transitioning over. So I think now MMA and mixing up your grappling has had an impact on Jiu-Jitsu sure. for the better, you know? Yeah, it'd be interesting. I did hear of one guy up when I was up in the Lake District, a Lakes BJJ. I can't mm -hmm. remember. He was a black belt uh, in Judo and then a blue belt in Jiu-Jitsu. And he was saying he was trying to put on a tournament for basically Judo Nogi, but with belts. So you had something to grab onto. And you said it was going to be judo rule sets. You're going to have to pin them obviously on the floor type of thing. And I always said, oh, that's No, weird. no. Like, uh, not like Sambo or Kurash. No, or it wasn't. Like, I, I might be wrong. He might have said it might have been like Sambo. But just again, it might have just been a belt to be able to grab onto, I okay. think it was. And I was like, that's a bit interesting. And again, his yeah. words was that. Unfortunately, judo is just not as entertaining, obviously, when it comes to it. Other than the nice big throws when you do get yeah. hit with it. But he said it might mix it up a little bit more and bring it back to life. I said, well, keep me in touch with it, mate. I'll be really intrigued to see with it. It's yeah. a different mix on it. but I mean, it might be someone else just trying to coin in and make some money for doing something oh, different. Yeah, but know. it might be the fact that he's tried it and it looks wicked. I mean, I'm like, I'm not one of these. People say, oh, they're just trying to make money. And they're, well, fair play to him. Because yeah. there ain't no money in this sport. No. Fair, good. <laughs> fair play to him. You've got to make money. Also, if it adds another dimension... And it makes something a bit trickier and gives me brilliant. Like what? Mm. What are we trying to hold back here? Like I don't like. Oh no, we have to only do jujitsu. Well, the IBJF, BJJF find out what happens when you do that. Mm. You get off things like the ADCC and Polaris, and then now we've got nobody watches worlds at gear anything anymore, <laughs> and everyone's tuning in for the ADCC. Yep. Well, there's a reason for that, right? Like make make things as interesting as people, what people want to see. This is my argument with Quintet. Did you catch any of it by any chance? Oh, yeah, I did catch a bit, yeah. I think the outcomes would have been completely different if heel hooks were allowed. 
Yeah. Right? And I was there like, again, and don't get me wrong, I, I, I like the idea of it and how that sort of team format goes. I was a bit frustrated, obviously, with Polaris and B team. I literally just all drawed and it was all yeah. based on the final match. But in my head, I'm there going, the outcomes would have been slightly different. I was like, why do they, they allowed everything else, but just hill hooks. And I was like, well, what's the point behind it? Like you've got knee bars in there. Everyone's trying to straight foot knock each other. Yeah. It's like, it, it's not as if what, you're not dealing with white belts trying to heal well, so no, but So I, I sort of understand where it's going from because now the leg game it can be very stale when you've got two good leg lockers. Ah, uh, okay, I'm with you. So yeah. it can make what would be an interesting match where people have to fight up from weird positions and they're both sitting on legs and trying to... Also, someone can get injured and then they're out of the next round or out of this, right? So I, I sort of see where they're going. Um, I think people are getting bored of the leg locks if they're not really into jiu-jitsu, right? Okay. Now, for everybody else, then the, the fans... Sport is a, is a business, right? Yeah. Now, when you're the fans and you're the ones who are watching, if you're getting bored because people are going for leg locks and sitting and not and holding on each other's ankles and heels and and you oh I can't watch this again another leg lock session. Mm. It impacts on your viewing. If you've got someone who usually like Jed, right? Amazing, uh, amazing guard, inverts really well, gets a heel from anywhere. That was out of his game. That was taken out of his game, right? So. Okay, it didn't make the guard... The guard passing was a bit tedious. Like, there was a struggle to get past the guard. But it was a lot better than, like, what he did to Paul Craig, you know? Yeah. Like, when you've got things like that, you're like, I get it, but it's over really quickly because someone's grabbed a heel hook and we haven't really seen a grappling match. Mm. And I think you're forcing people into... The, the trouble for... What I think, and listen, I don't know anything. It's just my opinion. Yes. Yeah, um, I think the scoring's the issue where you can have a draw. Like, yes. and then people's answer to that was go EBI rules. Well, I, that, like all you've done is start someone in a bad position they would never have been in. Yeah. So I think you go, for me, 10 minutes, mm. five minute overtime, everything scores. Stand-ups after 10 seconds of being held down inside control. Like, keep it fast-paced. You've got five minutes yeah. now to really work. So 10 minute normal. Five of the last five minutes is everything scores, man. Like, <laughs> that is it. And then you're gonna people are going to be on it for the last five minutes yeah. because at the moment it just gets nullified people get good at the same things this is the thing I think the argument with the EBI rules and I think Nicky kind of exposed it is that he'll play to the rule set to some yeah. degree to the point where I think the match with him and Big Dan for example like again this is my opinion on Nicky Rod he has the same style every single time which is I'm going to pull guard and we're going to, why is the big guy pulling guard? Then I'm just going to bum rush you with wrestling, body lock pass you, and then just keep busy. And if I can get you back, I'll get you back. And I think there's a moment with him and Big Dan where he went from side control to mount back to side control yeah. for no reason. And Big Dan was literally led there like, what's he doing? But he was just yeah. looking busy for the judges type stuff. Got to the EBI rules where he's just gone, oh, I've just practiced my back escapes and my arm bar escapes and everything like this. And he's gone on one type thing on technicalities if that makes sense yeah. rather than actually winning at a grappling match all of a sudden which yeah. is a bit frustrating like, so if you watch someone like Fionn mm. who's always trying to finish people yeah always when she's on the bottom she's fighting her heart out to get to the top to get to a better position to improve to like just doing that knee cut she's not yeah um, <laughs> but she's trying all the time and then if she knee cuts and she goes to side control and you move she's on your back she's looking for a finish she's going like that's way more entertaining than a really good heel hooker trying to invert and roll and like sit for heel hooks and get, like I get it. You, you you've rolled with me. I played a leg game a lot, right? Yep. But if I'm like, it's got to be exciting. Let's try and finish something. Mm. This is a spectator sport, and what you're going to do is at the moment, these guys are living off the wave of everyone's loving jujitsu because it's fast paced and it's heel hooks. You'll kill the game, and what was making you money and what was interesting it's will gone. dwindle away. The excitement will go out of it because people think, well, now everyone does that now. Yeah, like, yeah. everyone's doing that sort of thing. So you'll kill your own game. It's got to be, you've got to have that mentality of, I'm going out to kill people. That is it, man. And if, and if the thing that I'm good at isn't working, I better be good at three or four different things, you know? Yeah. Like, so it's a John Jones sort of mindset of like, <clears throat> oh, he's a good stand-up guy, call it stand then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not yeah. just, I'm going to go to my game and do the same thing over and over and over again and it just be, like, again, that's all I've got to rely on type stuff. So hopefully there's a few more people come out. I think Gordon obviously does take that on in the sense that, I go, don't get me wrong, I think he'd like to prove a point where, what was it, holding up his leg to Nicky Rod in the last ADCC tour, <laughs> where he'll just go, please take my leg because he'll hook you in 30 yeah, seconds yeah. type thing. But I think that's more to prove a point. But again, you just got to hope the individuals don't get too narrow-minded in terms of, I'm just going to be a leg locker and that's it. And I think 
it will do you justice so far, but if you want to become a better athlete, people want to see you in, not see you topple, but push yourself out of that boundary, if that makes I sense. Mean, it's a, it's a spectator sport. Yeah. Like, and jiu-jitsu never was. Grappling wasn't for ages. Mm. Now we've got loads of platforms who are putting on really good production shows. And it's, I'm like, right, don't forget it's a spectator sport. As soon as the spectators go, the shows go. As soon mm. as the shows go, you're no longer making money or you don't have a career. Because lots of these guys don't get punched in the face. They're not going to switch to MMA. Do you know what I mean? So if, if the money goes out of the sport or the televised... I say televised, but that's like you know, yeah, the, the, so on, stuff, in, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, if that goes, what do you do? You're back to competing in leisure centres on a Sunday for nothing, like where you got to pay fifty quid to compete. Like that is literally what will happen. Like it's a spectator sport. I um, mean, uh, um, oh, what's his name? Oh, Agra Agrazam, right? That's yeah. A, yeah. Everyone loves him because he just comes and he just competes, and he might lose. He like on polarity, might. But he, he's brilliant. He comes and he, he competes. That's how, that's the way it should be. This is why I like Ash Williams so much. Brilliant leg locker. Stands with everybody. Good wrestling. Nice trips. Nice sweeps. Good from everywhere. No really poor position. And he's there to have a fight with you. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Like it's, and I'm like, he fights people like um, Condit. So he fights bigger guys. He tests this. And I'm like, that's ju that is grappling now. This is like yeah. right. Let's just do it. Let's just go out there and let's do it because you're not losing brain cells. Like if you were fighting a guy who's forty pounds heavier in MMA, I'd be like, guys, come on, let's let's stop this. We it's not we're not pride anymore, and people are losing brain cells. People yeah. are ending their. That's not what this is. This is like let's make it exciting because as soon as the excitement's gone out of grappling, yeah. grappling's gone, and then we will we will get to that point again where there is no. Okay. High level grappling, you know, yeah. Go, yeah. So that's the only worry, but yeah, I'm not, you know, back to the original thing. I'm like, yeah, invest in everything like, get some judo, get some grappling, get, uh, sorry, get some wrestling, get some catch wrestling, get every have a little bit of everything, you know. Mm. Um, so back to probably the jujitsu side of things. So, when did you were you graded when you went to Brazil out of interest or not graded at the time? And nope. Not graded. So, when did you get your first belt and who was it from? Oh man, I got so. I got my first belt in 2000 and probably, what were now, 23. So I think it was probably around 2015, maybe. Okay. From Pedro Blue Belt. <laughs> um, so that was Pedro goes up. So obviously there was the big hoorah about me not having a black belt for ages. <laughs> Everyone talking like, and I was a bit like, I, I, listen, I don't care. I've sub black belts in black belt competition. Do you know what yeah. I mean? So I'd competed in black belt comps before I had a black belt and it, um, Naga and things, you know. And uh, so I, it, it didn't really worry me. I trained with black belts all over the world. Like I'd rolled with Marcelo and stuff, and I'd rolled with in my MMA career. I'd like trained all over the world, so I've trained with black belts. So I sort of knew where my level was. But so Ped's like, right, you got to do the Bristol Open. And I was like, okay. He's like a oh, white belt. I was like. All right. So, <laughs> so at this point, I've had like I don't know, fifteen pro MMA matches, like <laughs> right. one black belt no gi and stuff, and that. He's like, so I did it. Uh, no, I did the blue belt division. Sorry, I did the blue belt division. Won the blue belt and the absolute in gi. Got my blue belt <laughs> for winning the whole thing. He gave me my blue belt. So I was like, okay, so I did that, and then um, the next time out, I did the purple. I got I so. I lost, this is a gi again, no, not no gi, so in the gi, um, and I lost in the final of the purple belt on uh, an advantage or something, okay. something silly like that. and then I won the absolute, so I won the absolute in the in the gi, and that's, my, so I got my purple, and then I got my brown when, I, I it was something similar, like I did a brown belt thing, and I got my brown, but at brown I'd done a black belt comp and won a black belt comp as well and then so I said to Ped look can I do a black belt comp and then no I said yeah man let's do what you want <laughs> and then uh, so then I got my black belt last year whenever it was and like it, it was always frustrating of course because people who I taught were getting their black belts yeah, yeah. so people would come to my class to learn from me and they were black belts and I wasn't and it was frustrating I wouldn't lie I wouldn't say it wasn't but more because I didn't really understand do you know what I mean I was like Hang on, like I, I represented Pedro in Brazil. I've wore his logo on my fight shorts, and mm. I fought all over the world. I fought black belts in MMA, like, and 
you know, like, I'm like, so I didn't really understand. And then when he gave me my black belt, he said, whereas you've been a black belt for many, many years, he said, but some things have to be done the right way. He said, and you never cut any corners. And I was like, well, I guess I spent like two years at each belt, did a competition at every belt, won a competition at every belt. Mm. And so I sort of know where he's, I sort of understood a, a bit. I was sort of like, well, at least now I can hold my head up. And because he could have just gone straight, like, oh, here's your black belt, time, sir. Well, whatever. I mean, he could have done like, oh, yeah, I'm promoting you straight to Brown. And I sort of can hold my head up a bit and I can say, oh, well, I did every belt. Although I'd already won black belt comps when I was a blue belt. <laughs> but it makes sense to me now, you know? Like, I'm like, yeah, okay, I get it. And I appreciate it because also it makes you realize that it doesn't mean anything. It's got, it just got to mean something to you. Mm. Like, having my black belt meant, meant something to me in that people thought that I would probably quit uh, MMA back in the day, right? Because yeah. it was a nothing sport. And people are, oh, yeah, of course you're going to do MMA and stuff. So not only did I stick to MMA, but I stuck to jiu-jitsu and grappling long enough that I also got my black belt. Yeah. And it's like a, a big thing for me a, because I gave up on football as well. It's a big thing for me. It's like a, man, you did that. Yeah, you did that. You grind yeah. it out. You suck yeah. it out. So, you, you proved that uh, the girl he likes me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Right. He's yeah. Not, he, yeah, look at him now. <laughs> With his three kids and happy marriage. Um, yeah, it was sort of a, yeah, for me, it was a big deal because I was like, when I got my black belt, I walked away out of the room and I was a bit like, although like people were saying to me, like, Ped, like, you've been a black belt for years. In my head, I was like, done it though yeah because i could have just never bothered after that because well i know i'm a black belt i've sub black belts i don't need to bother i don't need to put gi on and i'd put my gi on and i'd go and i'd like you know i don't do much gi like well, yeah. I don't really gi. but i'd sub i'd sub people in a gi in black at black belt do you mm. know what i mean so i was a bit like okay i do know what i'm doing as well but it was nice to be like did it recognize you, did, you yeah. did it you, yeah, you yeah. stuck with it and you did it and that is the main thing like uh, for me it was I did it, I stuck with it, you know. That's interesting to hear. It's something you definitely hear with the lower belt ranks in terms of like, when am I going to get my blue belt? When am I going to get my purple belt? And it's like, I don't know, in terms of like an instructor, if you hear that, do you, do you, do you, I don't know, you personally kind of say, right, okay, you've now been just set back a couple more months all of a sudden or... No, 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 I, I don't. If somebody can come to me with a compelling argument as to why they should have it and I haven't given it to them, they'd get it. If you can tell me why you should get it, but I haven't given it to you, I'll give it to you. You'll never do that because, like, so I gave Owen his blue belt probably before he should have had it. The reason was he was training a fair bit. He had that setback with his broken arm. Um, then he had a setback with his knee, knee and stuff. But he would come and he'd watch when he wasn't training. And when new people would come and he'd help them. And he was doing stupid shit, which annoyed me, like going for straight foot locks. And I'm like, mate, you can't do, you can't go from an armbar to a triangle. What are you, what are we doing here? Like, come on, mate, let's get back to like, like I'm not, I'm trying to give you like a basis that you will build something off of, which people don't understand. They just want to sub people. Um, and so it got to the point, and I was looking at her, and I was like, where do we go with this? Uh, his progression's probably going to slow. So I thought, right, okay, I'm going to give him his blue belt, and I reckon it'd be the kick at the ass. Yeah. So I mean, he. It was decent enough that he would sub white belts easily. I mean, he could definitely do well against a lot of white belts, but there would be white belts out there who would give him a tough time as well. But I made the decision, I think this could be good for him. I gave him his blue belt. It was like a different person. Mm. Committed all the time, doing all the basic stuff, drilling a lot, coming in. Anybody want to train today? Because it was like, oh, there's reward, there's reward. Yeah. But I knew that about that person. There's other people who I wouldn't do that for because you're going to get your blue belt and you're going to lord out on that. That's going to be your reward. And your blue belt's not your reward. It's what it unlocks is the reward, yeah. right? So Owen, I just could tell he would have the perfect attitude for that. So that's why he got it. Um, and then you've got other people who probably, like Troy could have had his before he got his because he was, he's a monster. I mean, in that he's mental. <laughs> it's a whirlwind experience. As soon as you, you slap yeah. and tap, you're like, where's this going to go now? There's no quitting the guy. No. He's 100 miles an hour, but he gives blue belts a hard roll. So he probably got his a bit later than he should have done, but I was happy when I gave it to him because I'm like, it's always a test. If you're not getting it, and you decide that's it for me then. And I won't name names, but we've got people who train here 
girls and boys who train here and I know they've moaned about not having their belts mm. and yet they're here once a month yeah. twice a month or oh yes yeah, sorry I haven't been training for three weeks I've been injured yeah would well, you know what other people have done when they're injured they've it's sat and watched much. yeah like you came up when you were injured you came up and watched a few times mm -hmm. like mate literally when Cole had his surgery the day he got out of hospital he sat there on that sofa yeah. watched classes and then he was walking around the mat on the same week he'd had his shoulder surgery in a sling coaching people whilst I'm teaching the class and stuff and I'm like that that to me shows you really want this. Yep. It's not something to put on your Instagram and say, my, my blue belt, my blue belt, yeah. you know? It's like actions speak louder than words. Do you know what I mean? And it's just the case of like, you've got to show that level of where you want to go with this type of thing. And it's more than just, I don't know, on the mats, off the mat attitude and stuff like that as well to some degree. But no, that's interesting. I think one question that comes to mind and kind of a bit hot topic between all sort of jujitsu clubs and stuff. And I appreciate obviously this is an MMA club in that sort of sense. It may not apply too much, but I know you've had the experience in more jujitsu schools as well. Stripes on belt. <laughs> Now, I think I can agree with the That's argument. Well, hey, chill out, Siri. Um, I can agree somewhat with white belts in terms of stripes to kind of see, okay, are you like one, month one white belt or are you kind of month eight white belt? I can see that, but then there's a the discrepancy of like blue, purple, brown, and then kind of thing. What's your thoughts on stripes on belt then? Um, I, I don't like to criticise jiu-jitsu too much because I'm not a jiu-jitsu guy. Although I've spent a lot of time in jiu-jitsu, I'm not a jiu-jitsu guy, I'm a grappler. But, however, I think the only place for stripes are on a black belt. So you're three year, three year, five year. Sure. Like, I think that's where stripes should come in. I don't see any point in them for any other thing. I think what it does do, and this is the, the only bonus that I can see, it keeps white belts coming. <laughs> so said, yeah. <laughs> yeah like it keeps white belts coming oh someone else has got a stripe on it oh I might get my stripe on though because the rewards for your grappling is very small like when you're a white belt right? I know you got fresh, we're getting frustrated early on because <laughs> the progression's really tricky and that's where you gotta love you gotta love this shit and there was no two ways about it you loved this shit you went everywhere you trained your ass off you but I can I could see you get frustrated but that happens to people who like it mm. right People who who don't come back, they're not into it. Like you're, it's going to be frustrating. And as like I always say to people, you you'll train for three months. Say one thing will click. When that one thing clicks, ten things will open up. And you're like, wow, I just opened like a magic chest. It's full of amazing things. And then also, and you'll be stuck again for a year. <laughs> Nothing opens up. And then wrong, one yeah. thing happens, yeah. and forty things open up, and you're like. Oh, I'm getting it, right? It's just one thing has to click. And it, that one thing might have to be, oh, I'm not trying to sub people. Or, oh, I'm being too defensive. Or whatever it might be. Yeah. It might not be our move. It could just be one thing. Um, now, for me, I think stripes keep, keep people fresh when that's not happening. Mm. So if you've been coming for three, four months and you're getting a bit frustrated, but you can hold your own against people, it might be a case of, yeah, you get a stripe on your... And boom, I've just bought three more months out of you. I think it's a good ploy to keep people coming if you're running a business. Yeah, yeah. Um, but for me, it doesn't mean anything. It means absolutely nothing. Like, it doesn't... How much better is a three-stripe white belt than a one-stripe white belt? What's the... Does it go three stripes? Uh, uh, technically... Four. four. So, is. how much better is a four stripe white belt than a one stripe white belt? Like, how does that get? Yeah. Like, okay, so you know seven moves and he knows two. So, I, yeah. I don't understand. It's, like, if you're putting it on white belts and you're not quite putting it on blue belts, you're either a low level blue belt or a high level white belt. There's no in between. There's no. That is where you are, right? Mm. Also, you can be smashing every white belt in the club. You go to another club. And you start getting, find out, oh, actually, I'm having it put on me. For no other reason, then, you learn people's games. You learn how to implement your game. Yep. Now, that's why I advocate people training everywhere. Because I'm like, you, you're going to test yourself. Like, yep. You come here, you know the no-gi here is going to be different to your no-gi at um, oh, Hodger, yeah. right? Yeah. But whatever. It's going to be completely different. Not better, not worse. Not. I mean, you know we're going to have probably a lot... Um, I'm trying to think of a, a, a good way to phrase. Our wrestling will be like more, will be more wrestling heavy here mm. than the Hodgers, right? Yeah. That's that definite. Um, so you now know, oh, I don't really want to be on my back against a lot of them guys, especially the guys who are the same size or bigger than you, yeah? yeah. But 
you wouldn't not come here because of that. You come here no. because of that. Yeah, exactly. So I think like the stripe thing is like for me, I'm like, I don't know how somebody can be four times better than when they started without being a step up. <laughs> so I'm like, but yeah, you know, like each to run your club or you want to run your club, yeah. I guess, you know, like, yeah. it's, a, it's an interesting one, like I said, with the whole stripe thing. And I think one thing which I always pay kudos when I first started here was that in terms of getting positivity or like an element of the success, success story, I learned very quickly, it is not the sub that's the success story. Yeah. And I think, I even said to you, I think most times I'd roll in obviously on either a Friday night open mat or a Sunday like church session when we had those back in the day yeah, type yeah. of thing. It would be the case of, oh, I, I was able to just about roll skids or not roll, um, sweep skids. Yeah. That was my whole mission for the yeah, whole time. Yeah. Like nothing else, if I could get a sweep, that was it and all jobs, jobs are good. In. And I think where I personally sort of hone in on like, what is the little success story from this? Like, or not get subbed by someone. I know it's a bit defensive in terms of it, but it was like, right, okay, how's that going? And I think if you can't get to grips with that sooner rather than later when you start jujitsu, it's not necessarily going to be for you just because you don't get loads of big victories all the fucking time. And if you do get a big victory, majority of the time, either, like, I'm going to say that if you put work your ass off, let's say a sub only fight and you've got the victory, fantastic. That's probably not what I'm talking about. But let's say, I don't know, you sub everyone in the room. Let's say, obviously, you open mat last night. Obviously, there's a big weight disparity between me and the other guys there type of thing. I'm not naive to it. <clears throat> levels of different terms of jiu-jitsu levels. I think there's a couple of guys who were pretty new and obviously had Cole and Owen there type of yeah. thing. I'm not running off to the fucking Instagram going, fuck me, I'm the king of fucking Olympians yeah. open mat tonight. It's, you've got to get those success stories from just little bits of what you're trying to try type thing. And so... My my take on the way that everybody should be approaching jujitsu and grappling, and I will say jujitsu in this in this, and I will speak for jujitsu in this. My way of thinking is that there, so there is no success, there is no wins. If you're in competition, count your wins if you want to. That's fine, I get that. There is no wins in the gym. You will literally lose by subbing people. Like if you come here and you have got a really good rear naked choke and a really good armbar from guard. And in the last three months, you've subbed 30 people with a rear naked choke and an armbar from guard. For me, you've lost your last 25 rolls. Because, okay, but what you've done is, you've got two moves that you're good at. Where's the rest of your game? Jiu-Jitsu's not, not a two-submission game. Mm. Jiu-Jitsu's an ever-expanding group of skill sets. It all does, it's Lego. Jiu-Jitsu's Lego, right? My Lego life. When you, yeah, when you think you've got your Lego set, you can buy you can buy a I don't know uh, Star Wars theme yeah. a Star Wars themed <laughs> um, spaceship that you build, but I could also get another bit of Lego and put it on top and make it something different now. Yeah. Now what I can also do so the My Lego Life hashtag right so where that comes from I don't know if I've ever told you this so the reason I have that hashtag is because I I look at life like this so you're given a box and it contains Lego and you build something amazing. At some point, all of that is going to get broken, smashed up. So you can do one of a few things. You can either cry about it, leave it as it is, think, you're, think everything's ruined. You can rebuild it, or you can build it something better because of all the experience you've had whilst you built the last one. Mm. So you build something even better than what you had originally, and then you add something else to it. Well, that's jujitsu or grappling, right? Yeah. Like, if you're coming here and you're subbing, you're subbing the same people all the time, with the same moves you're losing for me because i'm like right i get it but so if i show you moves here tonight you come here and i'll show you a move i, I don't know let's say we've been doing arm triangles mm -hmm. and you know i teach sequentially so let's say we've been doing arm triangles so i'll show you an arm triangle we've been we've been doing that for three weeks the arm triangles then we go or head and arm if you want so we go head and arm and as we go to get it the guy goes to turtle so we go to gift wrap and off the gift wrap we go to the back take to a rear naked, or we go to a triangle from the rear. They're the things I've shown you. If you don't try each of those submissions that you've learned that night in your drilling, if you don't try them when you're rolling, you may as well not come. You may as well have turned up and just rolled, right? Yeah. You may as well just thought, right, I'm only gonna come for sparring. Because what I've just done, I've just shown you two new moves that you didn't know, and you've drilled them for the last hour and 20 minutes, and you've not tried them once during your grappling session, 
You might as well have not been here. You might as well have just turned up for rolling. We've heard it a few times from other coaches from different clubs where it's like, oh, we're going over, I don't know, straight foot lock, just for example. Yeah. And it's like, right, guys, now we've got live, dri live drilling. No one does it. They all go to their favourite moves straight away. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, what have we been just doing for the last sort of 50 minutes? And you can, start, you can start people situational. So I'll say, right, okay, guys, you're going to start in head and arm, right? And then people go to mate. And I'm like... <laughs> We've just been going over. <laughs> so that's why I don't do any situational sparring unless you've got a fight coming up or yeah. you're training for a comp because I want someone to put you in a bad position, always. If you're coming training and you're subbing everybody in the room with one or two submissions, you're losing grappling. You're losing it jujitsu. You might be winning the role. You're losing jujitsu. You're not... You're going to have these one or two moves. I mean, I'll tell you a perfect example. He might watch this and he'll never mind me calling him out. Tim Hughes. <laughs> Tim Hughes. I gave him his blue belt the other day, but he's been training for 20 years, right? Yeah. Do, do you reckon Tim Hughes could show you a go-go platter? Do you reckon Tim Hughes could show you an arm bar from the back? No, he couldn't. The reason being, Tim Hughes can squeeze your head really hard. <laughs> Tim, Hedge can, Tim Hughes can get an arm. But he does what he does. And he just loves rolling and he loves... And you'll say to him, mate, you're never going to get any better. No, but I squeeze the artist. And like, cool, I like that. Because he knows he's never going to get... Yeah. yeah, and so for me, I'm like, if you're going to jiu-jitsu and you are winning every single round with the same one or two moves, you're losing. You're, you're losing for me. And I say this all the time, or we get people here training and you'll hear me scream at them. I'm like, why are you on your back? And they're like, oh, well, um, I'm like, right, you're an MMA fighter. Yeah, you are, you got a fight coming up. Your whole game is going to be get ups or top control. Why are you playing guard? Why are you not using this opportunity to stand up and get or sweep or do something? Why are you trying to sub someone with an arm bar? You've done this. You're a blue belt. You know how to arm bar from guard. Get off your back. Like, <laughs> I was, it just you got to come to jujitsu and realize this is not a Rubik's cube. It's a jigsaw puzzle. So a Rubik's cube, you have a finite amount of blocks within this thing. A jigsaw puzzle or a piece of Lego, you add loads of bits together. It's not a Rubik's cube. It's a jigsaw puzzle or it's Lego. Always be adding more pieces, you know? And so, yeah, I just, I think you just got to come and keep expanding. Yeah, no, that makes... uh, I mean, otherwise, Black Belt, you've completed it, right? <laughs> well, you can say that now. <laughs> no, no, I'm just, like, it's not, like, I mean, I'm, I watch jujitsu all day, like, all the time. I'm watching, it might just be Instagram, so I don't sit and watch a lot of, like, I'll watch ADCC and I'll watch, like, um, the uh, trials and stuff. Yeah, I'll watch yeah. Polaris. I'll watch. I always watch Grapple Fest, and you know, like hopefully I'll be on Grapple Fest. My back let me down last time, so <laughs> hopefully I'll be there. But I watch Jujitsu. It might just be Instagram stuff, and I always see new stuff, and I'm like, oh, oh, that hand placement. Where did that? Where did that go? That was wicked. Yeah, like just what, whatever it may be, mate. You know, and I look at it, and I'm like. Oh, that is wicked. The sweep from... And I'll come in here and Mike will be like, mate, can you come here a second? And before the class, I'll spend 20 minutes drilling one move over and over and over. Just quick 20 minutes from... I'm like, oh, I really like that. It fits in... <laughs> Because I'm just, I'm just, I'm learning. Like it's no, just... Honestly, my wife fucking hates it, mate. Because she's there, like you're watching more jujitsu, and I'm like, yeah. And she's like, what, what's different about this? I'm like, to anyone else who just looks at it, it's just like two bodies just merged to each other. And she's like, what the fuck are you even looking at? And I'm like, I'm looking at his left hand and where it's going right now. And she's yeah. like, why just his left hand? And I'm like, because it's kind of important for this type yeah. thing. And it's just getting obsessed with it all together, and you just see those minor details. And I think. That's the biggest thing as well, is that as time goes on, I know I'm really fucking new in this whole thing, in this type of like, in my jiu-jitsu career, and that you find really simple fucking details, like what we were talking about beforehand, obviously, yeah. how you know, the, the anaconda is basically just the <laughs> reverse tri arm triangle yeah. uh, type of thing, and it, it clicks in your head, and you kind of go, oh, that makes complete sense now, type of thing, and you kind of go, well, why didn't I do this sooner, type stuff, and it's just, yeah, it's... it's, it's well, Part of that comes from, t from teaching and coaching as well. Um, I'm not saying you've been taught and co coached like this, but some people like to make jiu-jitsu complicated, and they like to make it feel like <laughs> I'm the <laughs> wizard, and I figured this out, and I'm like... <laughs> Well, what was but, the, I think it was the single leg X. Like, Watch the Danaher type of thing. You said, you're putting in extra stuff for the fucking sake of it, Jay. Like, just stop yeah. fucking doing this. You don't need to do X, Y, and Z. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, you just, and it's like with the arm bar, like I sent you earlier, I say this to everybody. Now, I might, the other day I was teaching a, from Butterfly Guard, coming up and you sit round, you, 
you go butterfly guard, you go for the, I can't remember what it's fucking called, but a leg comes over the, the arm. You go, oh, I'm so, I've been punched in the head way too much. You and then you sit back and you take the back off of it. So like a rubber guard type thing? Or mm, like so, yeah, I, I can't remember what it's called, mate. I'll show you. you like, so I'm in guard here yeah. and uh, I'm here, I'm in butterfly maybe. Leg comes over, so I'm attacking the arm, but the foot's in. I sit back over and I take the back. So, and you go for the arm bar off of that, and yeah. um, I'll show you afterwards, I'll show you, and then you can, you can record it if you want, and put up another <laughs> thing and say, this is what Wes was on about. Yeah. Um, so then, um, I, I will, I, it'll probably come to me, the name is well. And Sorry. so I'm showing it the other day, and then somebody's going like, oh, I don't understand now, how are you getting the arm bar? I'm like, look, guys, I can't explain this any way better. An arm bar is an arm bar is an arm bar. No matter what. If I'm doing it with a straight arm bar with my hands, I'm using my arms to get it, like, uh, of any sort of fucking arm, like straight arm bar from side control and I sit up and I take the straight arm bar there. If I'm doing an arm bar from guard, if I'm doing an arm bar from the back, I am hyper extending the elbow joint. Mm. That's what I'm doing. So that means that the elbow joint has to be past the groin and it means that my, the arm has to be in a way that the elbow can, can move that way. If the arm's off to the side, I won't get it. If the arm's past the groin, I won't get it. If you keep two fundamental things in, the, el the elbow joint has to be past the groin and the arm has to be in a way that it can be hyperextended. Mm. Nothing else matters, right? So if my hips are off to the side, I'm not getting this. I might have to take it over to my leg. I can still get it. I might get it. But it will just be an arm bar. I just won't be, yeah. be over to the other side. <laughs> yes. it, it still has to be past my groin. Yeah. That's, that's all you need to remember about any arm bar. So whenever you go to this position now, because we're only drilling, go slow. When you fall in a weird position and your arm's not there, don't stop. Put the arm back into the position it needs to go into. Come back and now think, right, that's where I need to go. Next time you go over and you fall, keep your arm. That is it. An arm bar is an arm bar is an arm bar. You can make it as complicated as you want. And you can do all these. But if the elbow joint's past the groin, if the arm bar, if the arm's straight and it can be hyperextended, you have yourself an arm bar. <laughs> like that, that is it. All these other things, the way I set it up, yeah, okay, that's going to be intricate. The way I set it up is fine. But the arm bar, we don't have to worry about. If we just now know, if I can get to that position, I can put an arm bar on, get into the position is the problem, right? So, I don't, and it's the same with that thing with you, with the anaconda, when you were saying to me, you're and I'm like, but an anaconda is a head and arm choke. So, how how you think about escaping the head and arm choke when you're in a, nor, uh, when you're in a um, uh, head and arm choke from the bottom, let's say. Yep. You're in an head and arm choke, but the guy's the other side of you. It's like a north-south head and arm choke, right? Yeah. And as soon as you realise that, you're like, oh shit, yeah, it is a head and arm choke, isn't it? It makes it simpler. Yeah. But it's complicated because people want it to be complicated because they want to make people out like they're a wizard. Do you think John Dinerhood doesn't help with this with his uh, 12, <laughs> 12 video long instruction on uh, the grip fight or something stupid like so that? So this is the thing. A, John Danaher is genuinely like autistic genius guy, right? <laughs> so there's that. I think his mind works like that. His mind wants to make everything as complicated as it, as it can be because he wants to analyze everything. He wants to break it down. He wants to know if there's variable. another way. And the best way to figure out every defense is to know every version of it. So I get that. Also, John Danher wants to make money. <laughs> yeah. So there's Pretty a lot of fun. people who think, like, oh, this guy loves this. He does, but he's also making a lot of money. He was a professor. He quit his job just to do jiu-jitsu not because of the love and he's living off of no money because he's getting paid to do it right and the reason he's got loads of instructions out is because he's making money fair play to him make your money get punched in the face for your life like me and earn no money or make money doing make money also he's fucking amazing yeah so for me that's not the way i teach as you know i'm not i don't want to show you 30 different variations and steps and add this and it's what he does. He does it amazingly. He coaches the best guys in the world. So I won't criticize him at all. But I think sometimes you're adding stuff for the sake of adding stuff because nobody else has added it on their, added it on their DVD maybe. That's true. Actually, that is very true. Especially with all the drama between sort of, I don't know, Gordon's boy lock passes versus Nicky Rod's boy lock passing. Yeah, it would be like, exactly identical other than, I don't know, Nicky does a fucking fancy dance afterwards or something like, stupid. <laughs> you've, you've had a private from me on just specifically on body lock passing, mm. right? And we looked at some principles because, as you know, I teach principles. That's what I try and say to people. Like, I don't know anything in jiu-jitsu that nobody else doesn't know. 
some people might know more than I do, but generally we all know the same moves by now, you know. Mm. Somebody adds something, like a, a tenth planet guy, I throw something up, which no point me learning because I, I won't be able to get it anyway. this random direction, yeah, it shouldn't go. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not getting a buggy joke. I can teach you a buggy joke, but someone else has got to demonstrate it, do you know what I mean? Like, but there's things get added, but generally we all know the same moves or a new move comes out and within a week we all know it. So we all know the same moves. What I like to teach is principles of jujitsu. Why do we do this? Why does it work? When do we, like, uh, like the fact that jujitsu is a fight for space. Mm. As soon as you understand that, somebody wants space, somebody doesn't want space. So if you're going for uh, I don't know, a rear naked choke from the back and there's space between my belly and your back, chances are I'm probably not going to rear naked choke you, right? So it's now a fight for space. Yeah, I'm choking you. Look, but if you, if you can create space and get your back on the mat, I'm not choking you anymore. So the principle is, Jiu-Jitsu would fight for space. Now, okay, right, we know that. That's simple, right? Well, okay, so at which point does who want space? But as soon as you know the principles, the moves are just bits that we add in, and nobody really knows better moves than anybody else, and other people are better at getting them, but we all sort of know the moves, so let's not teach the moves too much. Let's teach the principles of Jiu-Jitsu and add moves in when they can, you know? Yeah. That's only my way of thinking. No, there's a guy on Instagram, I can't remember his name is, but it's, it's jiu-jitsu something, and he, again, talks in the same sort of mannerisms of different things, in the sense he'll be like, right, you're on half guard here, like, you just want to create space and here, and he said, for whatever reason, we don't use our legs, so step on the actual ankle of, the, of your opponent who's on top, so then you can pin him down as you're sort of framing away type thing, mm -hmm. and just, he talks of it in terms of, like you said, like principles and stuff, but rather than being like, this is the fancy technical term from Jean Danaher, who likes to chuck some Japanese word at the same time and yeah. type of thing but Look, I mean mate uh, I know a lot of Japanese words I'm a judo guy and yeah. I use them here and people go uh, I'm like exactly right <laughs> so I, ju I just think if you can understand the principles in certain positions the moves become easier because you understand like you know like if someone's got me held down inside control and they've got one under one over inside control do you know what I mean we're in a 50 50 but he's on top inside control I know the principles are, I need space. I can't do, there's nothing I can do. There's not a single move that I can do from there without creating some space. Mm. So we've got, right, how do, we get, how do we get the space here? So I need to get my arm over. I use like, a, I make create like a barrier, put a barrier between him and I, which might be my arm. I then yeah. use my hips to create the space. As soon as that barrier, get, as soon as I got like two inches of space, I can circle my arm under eyes and I got the underhook. Yeah. Right, now I got the underhook, I'm now controlling the space. So the fight for space has happened. Now I'm controlling the space. So now the person on top is thinking, oh God, I don't want that space. I need to take that space back. <laughs> and I'm creating more of it. So I'm now using the space that I created. He's trying to stop the space that's created. And now we're back in this fight for space again. As soon as you understand that, you're like, right, okay, so where am I now? What do I want? Oh, I don't want any space now. Like, do you know what I mean, he's in my guard. He's posturing up. Okay, brilliant. I kill the space there. As soon as you realize that, you're on the path, and now, right now, I just had some moves in. I get last. I get flashbacks. I think my first comp, I think Mike was in the corner, and he was like, all right, we'll just practice some like, arm pummeling and just like inside out before going to my first match. I remember doing it. I'm like, I don't know why the fuck I'm even doing this right now. <laughs> and, I look, and I look back, and I'm like, you had no idea. Yeah. <laughs> you had no idea what was going on. Um, so I want to kind of go back onto your journey a little bit because we've gone on a bit of a tangent. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Oh, that happened when you talked to me, right? I know. Like, this is why I started doing podcasts as well. So you're going to go on loads of fucking tangents. So... In terms of, I know obviously you've got loads of fucking MMA history and obviously how much I want to go into that. I just want to try and stick to the grappling side of things. When you obviously went to Brazil, I know you obviously went to America, you've gone around the world and that type of stuff and trained with loads of different people. It's obviously loads of different people come up all the time. Which area do you think you leveled up your grappling that much more? Has it always been at home? Well, if ho at home was the answer to that question, that's great. Where do you think was like second best then? Um, I'll tell you one thing that really sticks out to me. I trained with Marcelo um, years ago, 2009 maybe, and he did a thing of butterfly guard. Mm. I'd never seen butterfly guard before. Um, I'd seen it, but I'd never had it broken down to me, let's say. Yep. So he did a little thing on, sem on uh, butterfly guard. About three hours we were training and something like that, and I rolled with him a bit, and his butterfly was fucking phenomenal, obviously. <laughs> don't and, uh, but, so I was like, I like butterfly guard, I'm going to do butterfly guard. And I spent a year starting in butterfly guard. And... Uh, and I mean a, a year, like I just, every time I rolled, I'd start in Butterfly Guard. That was it. Like, and uh, I'm, a, I'm a top guy. I'm an MMA fighter, right? You're, I'm a top guy. <laughs> I started in Butterfly Guard for a year and I was getting smashed. And people would 
past my guard. We'd start in like, right, okay, winner stays on if you pass guard. People pass my guard. And you could tell them sort of like celebrating. You, I could, maybe it's my ego, but I was like, they're celebrating. But I would think like, fuck it, they don't know what I'm doing. They don't know what I'm doing. I'm just doing my battlefield guard. They don't know what I'm doing. And you act. I had to swallow it, and of course there was a part of me wanted to say to people all the time, like, yeah, well, I'm only practicing my butterfly guard. <laughs> Do you yeah. know practice? But I knew I'm only practicing my butterfly guard. Now, of course, once I'd get sweeps from my butterfly, I'd carry on and I'd roll. Or from butterfly, I then learned how to get a head and arm from the bottom, or I learned submissions from butterfly as well. Yep. I didn't just go butterfly, and then, oh, I swept through, come on, guess, go back to butterfly, you know. I'm it, the it, sweeping it, king. <laughs> yeah, I just, but... I did that and I never looked back of like, oh, but, and you get, people were passing my guard who should never pass my guard and people were in it and like ending in positions where, or I'd get caught with something because I'd go for a head and arm from the bottom and someone would take my back or something, whatever it would be. And I was like, but at the end of it, I was like, man, my butterfly guard's got really good. Mm. Like, I haven't lost part of my limbs because people have been subbing me. It's not like, oh, I've been subbed 10 times, one finger goes, <laughs> like, so basically, I'm not hurt. I've developed my game. Perhaps, perhaps you just have to stick to the stuff that you want to improve on mm. and just do that for a bit. And it really clicked for me and it made me realise, like, ah, oh, I get it. Like, I get it. You just need to work at this stuff. You just need to do it and do it. And it doesn't make no difference who subs you. It doesn't make no difference who... Like, someone subbing me doesn't take away from my game. This is what people don't get. If someone subs me, it can add to their game, right? it will 100% add to my game because it will make me think about the defense where I made my mistake. How did I get caught? Yeah. How did, if you're into jiu-jitsu, it will make you do those things. It may add to their game. So you might think, oh, I really enjoyed that. I got that move. I don't usually get it. It might not because it might be their one of their two moves. <laughs> but yeah, it never takes away from my game. Someone subbing me never takes away from my game. It can only add. Even if you get subbed at the gold medal match, the final, at ADCC, if you get subbed, it can only add because you've got something to go away and look at. Right, mm. I made a mistake. or So being sub can only add to your game. So I think that's where it came to me where I thought like, oh, right. So I've just spent a year doing this. I got my guard path, loads, whatever, but I'm better at this now. So that's how I looked at everything. When I want to learn something new, I'll start myself in that position or I'll go over that or I'll, you know, and I just, it just made me realize like, it doesn't matter who's passing my guard. It doesn't matter what other people think. It doesn't matter... I'm going for this, and that's what I did. So I think that was a big thing for me. Um, I mean, obviously, like, the, the fact that I trained with Marcelo, who I didn't appreciate as much back then. It, I mean, he was still Marcelo, but now he's like a god, isn't he? You know, mm. He's like a legend. So, um, But I didn't appreciate as much back then. Um, but it did, yeah, it made me think, like, because of that, because he did butterfly, it made me think, oh, yeah, man, I understand. I've got to develop this. Did you... A quick word about one of our sponsors, Grappler's Soap. The team wanted to find, right, the best possible defense against skin infections, which normally we get from each other or off the mass. This, in turn, led Dan and the team into researching more about soaps and essential oils, which turns out has been used for thousands of years, actually, as a natural defense against infection during the plague. Slight twisted story here, but grave robbers in England knew of the power of essential oils and smothered themselves in it before exhuming and stealing corpses. Useless fact of the day for you there. But Dan and the team had tried several soaps before, but none of them just simply wowed them. So he started to make his own. Months more research, trial and error, led to finally this golden nugget, grappler soap, which you'll be pleased to know the recipe is CPR registered and approved by pharmacists. The use of a specific method to lock in the amazing natural smell, no cheap fragrances used here, which means the soap and use smell great and stand the best chance of staying healthy. Although the soap was developed for grapplers alike, it is now widely being used by non-grapplers. And Dan is always like delighted to hear from from customers about how it's cleared up dry and itchy skin or relieved eczema or just simply made you feel f awesome the smell alone has been a massive hit with men and women alike so enough waffle for now go and get yourself some now at www.mrbassett.com or go check out their instagram page for some very funny memes at grapplers soap thank you guys go to one of his seminars intentionally I was or... in America and it just like yeah just timing yeah, yeah just timing just passing by yeah just nice timing, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, so when you obviously you've travelled in different countries and stuff, did you find there was like a different genre of grappling in different areas all the time? So like, I, again, I'm just <clears> putting <throat> examples. Here. I went to Brazil. Most of them ended. Up, I don't know, the example would be you went to Tenth Planet. Everyone's doing fucking uh, rubber guard all the time or something like this. When oh, you went over in Europe or experience, mate. <laughs> I, uh, Go on, let's break that down. <laughs> I messaged Eddie. I was like, hey, mate. I'm in. Uh, I, I trained with Eddie before, and um, I was like, hi, Eddie, you probably won't remember me, blah, blah, blah. And like, hey, he's like, hey, where's... And I don't know if you remember me, just how he responded on the email. <laughs> he's like, um, yeah, uh, yeah, come by tonight. Come by this time. We're starting with, like, Mary Jane... Our warm-up was like, Mary Jane into Mayflower into... And I'm like, what the fuck? Am I bringing my own weed here? I don't know what any of this is. <laughs> so I'm literally going on YouTube to look at what the warm-up is. And I'm like... So yeah, just come and get war jump in, that'll be the warm-ups, and then we'll go on with class. And I'm like, I just want to roll with people, right? And I'm like, <laughs> so I had to watch on YouTube the warm-ups. And then when I get there, I literally go on the mat and I speak to someone, like introduce or whatever, and I speak to one of the guys and I was like, I haven't got a fucking clue how you guys warm up. I was like, what? I was like, sorry, dude, I'm a, I'm like a MMA fighter who does like normally it's like, yeah, don't, don't worry, dude, just we'll go through some stuff. So got warmed up with them guys. Once it was rolling, it was okay, but yeah, I was like I did not. Like, <laughs> I watched on YouTube. I was like, I'm not learning this. I can't like it. Um, so yeah, the question was um, stuff that different impact. genres yeah. in like different countries and gyms okay, and stuff yeah. like that. Did you find there was a consensus, or was it quite varied across the boards? I appreciate you giving your basics in places, which is yeah. fine. But did you find it with different areas? Um, it, so it's just different style sort of things that I guess mate. Like so, like. Um, Brazilians always try and kill you. <laughs> <laughs> I might use I might you know, I might use that as a tagline. Like, like, Brazilians try and kill you. <laughs> try and kill you, right? Um, in Brazil, like I've trained a lot in Brazil. Brazilians try and kill you. Um, but after a couple of days, you're in. If you keep going back and you're you're not on all, like yeah. you're in. Do you know what I mean? And they see like, yeah, okay, this guy comes out. Like, Black House, mate. When I went to Black House, Kenny Johnson. This was MMA, but yeah, loads of Brazilians, loads of good black belts and uh so and kenny goes hey this is wes he's a high level mma fighter from the uk fights for cage wars and we're on sparring day so i'm like shut up and he's like yeah he's got a fight and he's this i'm like please shut up shut up so then you do rounds and it's like five minute rounds and you just stay on you can sit out when you want they did eight back to back with brazilians trying to kill me that's like, that whole thing oh you can sit out if you want to in like, i'm not sitting out like no, as, soon like, as, as soon as i, soon as I, I break wouldn't sit out because i'm like if people ask me in their gym it's my first thing so like i sparred with alan juban who fought in ufc now does we had a great spar james Montessori, we had a great spar loita mashida good spar and then all the young <laughs> like World Series of Fighting guys, a couple of guys who were in the UFC, younger younger Brazilians, like, oh, this motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> that was horrendous. But then, um, yeah, and then, so I would go, I remember once, mate, this is, I mean, like, so Studio 540, for instance, I trained at Studio 540 a lot because it was an amazing place. You go into Studio 540, Rob Zepps is like, I don't know if you know about Studio 540, so it's I not don't. affiliated to anybody. Okay. It's an open gym, and... You'd go on a Wednesday night and Ronda Rousey might be teaching the judo. She's just passing by or something. Or wow. Kenny Florian popped by, so he was teaching. And just it's not affiliated to anybody. It's an open gym. You can go and crash it whenever you want. Wow. So I went to Studio 540. And Rob Zepps is an English guy. And he's like, no, dude, you don't pay to train here. You can just come in and train. I was like, you sure? He's like, yeah, yeah. So I would go there and it was amazing because there was no bullshit. And I'd go and I'd put a gi on for the first session. And I rolled with a couple of guys in a gi. And then... Uh, the next day I went and it was no gi. Rob was saying, I was like, fucking hell, you're a different person. I was like, I'm not a gi guy. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so it was great because everyone's stars are mixing in. And then I'd go to like, I went to a place in Colorado Springs and uh, there was a guy called um, uh, Marcelo Motta, his name was, I think. Yeah. And so I go in and pay a drop in fee. He's like, I introduced myself, like, my MMA fighter trained. He's like, oh, what belt are you? I was like, well, like, I'm a That's blue a great area. belt. <laughs> yeah, I'm a blue belt, but I, I'll be honest with you, I have been training for a long time, blah, blah, blah. So I go on the mat with him, I roll with him, and we roll for, like, five rounds straight, do you know what I mean? And uh, uh, he, after the second round, he stopped me. He's like, let me stop you. He said, you don't do that here. I was like, what do you mean? He said, you sub me. He said, you could have caught me with that. He said, you sub me. He said, in this gym, he said, if you can catch me, you catch me. You don't be nice to me. I was like, oh, you, he's like, no, no. He said, you catch me. He said, I'll know that you can catch Black belt, good black belt. Yep. And uh, so 
I did. I caught him with a few stuff, a few things. I'm a, I was a bit heavier than him, to be fair. I was like, I'm like 88. He was about 76. And that. So sure. I was heavier than him. But he's like, yeah, that's how we were. You, he said, if you can catch me, you catch me. You don't be nice to me. And he put one of his purple belts on me because he had a comp coming up. But after four rounds, mate, we're in Colorado Springs. The altitude, so I'm high. dead. <laughs> dead. And afterwards, at the end, he's like, can you, get, can you give him his money back? I was like, what? He said, you don't pay when you come and train here, mate. No way. He said, like, it was a pleasure having you on the mats. Give me my money back. And he would not let me pay every day when I went and trained. I was like, man, like, so yeah. that was awesome. That was wicked. And then you go some places where it's real technical. They don't care about the fact you've dropped in. You, you pay your money. It's really like, yeah. And it's not, that, it's not worse. It's not like, I'm not saying like people should be nice to you and give you stuff. No, yeah. no, no, that's not the way it is. Like I, people say to me, here's the first session free. I'm like, no, you come, you train. If you don't think it was worth it, don't pay. If you think it was worth it, pay. Because I'm like, if you think what you did here was worth the money, you pay your money. And if you don't think it was worth it, don't pay. Mm. I mean, you won't come back a second time if you didn't pay. Right? So, <laughs> um, yeah, so I think there is no, like, then I'd go and train, like, up north. Or when I trained with Eric Paulson and them guys, it was different. <laughs> it was different. People would want to be on top and they'd want to grind you out and they'd want to be, like, you know. So that was different. American top team when I trained there, amazing jiu-jitsu guys. But they were... We were MMA guys, like, you know, like, rolling with some really good, like, Tiago Alves and people like that. Like, when they'd get on top, you weren't getting off. You were, like, you know, weren't getting out. What was American top team like back then, obviously, in comparison to now? I know, obviously, I forget his surname. Is it Dan? Uh, um, Dan Lambert. Yeah, who, who obviously it, yeah. owns it all and everything. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they've got fucking... To be honest, they could compete quite easily with the UFC PI type thing in terms of, yeah. like, what they've got facility So, they've always wise. been that. So, my first time there was 2008. Jeff Monson was over here training with us and he asked James Thompson if he would go over and help him train for Pay the Pano. And uh, James was like, yeah, yeah. I was like, so me and Jeff got on really well while he was here. We trained together a lot and I used to drive him about a bit. And he's like, oh, well, you should come. He said, there's loads of good guys. I was like, yeah. He said, yeah, yeah, come. So we, James and I went to uh, American Top Team and it was a good time to go because the only person who'd been there really was Brad Pickett. Okay. So Brad was out there and we were out there. That was good. So he, we were, I had an introduction because I knew Brad really well back then. And uh, we went there. Dan Lambert's like, oh, guys, come to my house tonight. And whatever. And so we were going to hit, so we were going to Dan Lambert's at like two in the morning and roll in. Me, James, uh, Jeff Monson and Dan Lambert, just the four of us, because Jeff would wake up at two o'clock in the morning because he was seeing a Russian woman. So the time difference. <laughs> and I'm like, what have you been doing? He's like, oh, He's like put up jerking off on when like, <laughs> what he's like yes yeah, so we'd ring us at 2am and be like can you guys come train and we'd go and train at 2am in the morning or whatever oh, just I mean, like, so no, like no. me James Dan Lambert and Jeff Monson do you know what I mean we'd go and roll for a couple of hours because James was every good time Jeff you get a phone call was like oh, he's just called me up to go and roll he's just been wanking off yeah. every time <laughs> like, he's going. I'm not saying every time but, yeah and he lived so Jeff lived in one of the back rooms at uh, American Top Team. Okay. So, but it was good because also when I was there, Sab Judah came by because he was fighting um, Floyd Mayweather. So I got to spar with Sab Judah for a bit and that, that was really cool. Um, the sparring MMA-wise was amazing. Like, But they had phenomenal... There was a guy there called Rudy. Oh, he went to the Olympics for judo. Rudy... I can't remember his name, that black guy. Him and I had amazing judo days, you know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, there's a guy, um, we did our strength and condition with a guy called JC Santana. Okay. He, he owns the Institute for Human Performance in California. Yep. Works with he's Gilbert Burns' guy, guy yeah. now. So me and James, he was like just up and coming. And uh, so we were going to his every day, getting strength and condition with this guy. Like just amazing. It was wicked because we were early on. Um, so yeah, American Top Team then was like, Light years ahead of everything. Mm. Like it could have been a, a, an institute for performance then. Do you know what yeah. I mean? So now with even more, like Mike. So we hung out. I hung out with Mike Brown a lot. Yeah. So Mike Brown was like the nicest guy in the world. He was active, but he just had surgery, so he wasn't active. We were out loads every night. We'd go out together. We'd train together a lot. And so Mike Brown, you just could tell back then this guy's going to be a coach, man. He's like, he was coaching then, but mm. you just could tell the way his mind worked and the way that he thought about MMA. You were like, yeah, this guy's, this guy's a coach. You can tell him. Yeah. You know? yeah, ah, that's wicked. cool. And one thing I actually do ask quite a lot because when you look at some of the jiu-jitsu clubs around the world type of thing, they, they act like a whole complete club and it's mm -hmm. like a team emphasis around it. And it's all to do with like up, uh, uplifting each other. Um, so the examples being like Atos, being obviously <clears throat> B Team, being obviously New Rave, being obviously all the other teams that come sort of come to mind to it. But in the UK and like sort of obviously England and Scotland, Wales and all that type of jazz, there 
is that there doesn't seem to be, other than Drake, I feel, right, mm -hmm. there just doesn't seem to be like this kind of equivalent of like American top team, but for like jujitsu. And I don't know why it seems to be all so segmented, if you see what I mean. Like, yeah. I've joked with other people before, like to be able to get the likes of you and other, other people, obviously, of that caliber, just all in the same room, then go, right, here is this one fucking epic school type thing. It's enough, lift it. But I just don't, do you think there's any reason why, other than people with maybe personalities, or maybe it's just the fact that, People just think they're better than each other. I don't know. Like, what? I think it's because people know they're not better than each other. I think that's the real. If you if you got down to it, like people are scared that other coaches are better than them. Um, so I think that people have got this competitive thing. So you know me. You know I work with my MMA fighters, for instance. Like mm. I let my MMA guys go and spar at Sweatbox. Yeah. Grant, when he was fighting out of here, I'd let him go to Renegade, yeah. and they're like, "Oh man, you're letting them." Like, yeah, damn right. They're, like they need sparring. They're, they've got a group of. 10 guys there, we've got four. If I can send my four to them 10 and they can all work together. Mm. Also, look, if you go to Sweatbox and being coached by Paul Reed and sparring with those guys suits you better, please don't come back here. Please stay there. Like, if it's a better fit for you, it works better for your game, you're getting better coaching and the sparring's better, please don't come back here, man. You're being punched in the face. You're losing brain cells. Don't do it somewhere where it's not as good a fit for you. Mm. And it's the same with jujitsu, right? Like, if you go somewhere and you want to have uh, all your game is 10th planet rubber guardy, fighting from the bottom, you want to do learn buggy chokes and this and that, like, yeah, go, go somewhere else, by all means. Like, you're welcome to come here and spar. Everyone knows that. My gym's an open door to everybody. Yeah. But... You go where's the best for your game. Please don't hold your game back to stay loyal to me. Like, go where's best for you. Develop and get the best that you can get. Like, clubs locally in Bristol have said to me, oh, I'd really like to come and get you to do a, a come and do a seminar on wrestling and takedown. Mm. Um, would you come into the gym and do wrestling and takedown? Because so-and-so would benefit from it. I'm not going to say who these people are. I was like, yeah, but also they can come to my class anytime I'd. I said, if they want to come on a Monday or a Friday, Monday, obviously, if they come in, I'll make sure I do loads of takedown and wrestling stuff for them. Yeah. And if they come on a Friday, the level of our nogi grappling, that we can start from standing. It's going to be like, you know, like send them there. Boom. Of course, they'll never turn up. Mm. And I'm like, are you worried they're not going to come back to you? Like, what? Mm. I'm not trying to steal anybody. I'm not like, I don't care. Yeah. I don't. I, if, it's simple. If two people started coming to my club and nobody else, I just won't do the club anymore and I'll go and train elsewhere. Like, it's not, it's yeah. that simple. And if 35 people come, I'll be here and I'll train everybody. It's that, that's how it is for me. So I just think people are worried that maybe they get exposed that actually, oh, I've been showing these guys wrestling. They'll go somewhere else and realize their wrestling's not as good. But it's not. Like, so... In, be honest about that and say go there get your wrestling and yeah. then I'll be honest to them yeah go back to your other club mine because I can't show you all the gee stuff and Will Southern's a perfect example right mm -hmm. so Will Southern uh, now it, um, Hodger yep. so Will's like oh mate what am I going to do I was like mate listen I'll put a gee on I'll train with you every day that I'm available I said but mate I'm, we're not a gee club I was like we're going to be doing stuff I was like with your no gee if you've got a no gee stuff coming up I, I would recommend you come here, right? Especially yeah. with ADCC style stuff. Yep. This is where I would recommend you come in Bristol. You come here. But I recommend you probably go to Hodger if you're going to leave where you're at. Yeah. Because it's the best place for you. They take jujitsu seriously. They've got loads of gi guys. They've got guys your sort of weight. Now, it doesn't benefit me to say that, but I'm not in this for me. Like, it's... it's for my career's over. Like, I'm not... It's for you. I think... You can judge somebody who they are by a coach by what they show you, mm. or you can judge somebody as a coach by what they want from for you or from you. And when you add your thing as well, and mm. I was like, mate, look, you can come here whenever you want, but we don't do gee mine, so <laughs> you need to go elsewhere. Yeah. And they're not going to let you represent us if you've got a gee on. You need to go there. Do you know yeah. what I mean? That's where you should go. And from that day, I've never stopped you coming here. You come here. You're, you, I consider you part of Olympians. That's why you're still in the group. <laughs> you're still in... Like, you don't have to wear our badge. Like, Will Southern doesn't wear our badge when he competes. Do you know what I mean? Like, you don't have to wear our badge. You're part of the Olympians crew. You come to the Christmas meals. You come... And that's because I want you to get better at Jiu-Jitsu. I don't want you to say, oh, Wes is the greatest coach. Wes is... The... I'm not interested. Like, 
I want you to get better at jiu-jitsu. And if you attribute that to me and what you've learned from me, absolutely fantastic. Um, however, though, my gym's not a business. So if you have to keep people coming through your door to keep your gym open, I understand why people want to protect that. Yep. And they want people to keep coming and they don't want them to realise you can go elsewhere for this. So if you're charging £65 a month for a membership, it's hard to say, it's £65 a month. Yeah, but I don't come on a Monday and a Wednesday because I go and see Wes for no gi stuff. Well, it's still £65 a month. It's hard to justify, right? I think it's interesting. If you take the names and the actual like classes that you're talking about type of thing, right, and you take it down to the bare bones of stuff, if you do a good job of what you're offering, right, you don't need to try and get people through the door. That, exactly. that, that's it, right? Let's say you're the expert of building Lego, let's say, right? Yeah. If you are really that good, you don't have to worry about people turning up to it, yeah? You might have to market yourself a little bit to say yeah. this is what I do, but it makes no fucking difference and type of thing, right? It, if there's someone else who's better than you at it, then it, hey, it will transpire and yeah. that's where people will go. And listen, if you're better than me, like, if you give me 100 people, 100 people, not all of them are going to, A, like the way I teach. Mm -hmm. They're not going to like my honesty. That's one thing people will struggle with here is yeah. like how brutally honest I am. Yep. If, you're, if you're not getting something and you're, saying, you're making excuses in front of everyone, I'll tell you, no, let me stop the bullshit because you haven't been here. Stop talking nonsense, shut your mouth, keep training. That's the way to get better. The only reason I'm a black belt and I'm better than you is because I kept coming to jiu-jitsu. You don't come. You ain't going to get better. And that, you know that's what I'll get said, right? Yep. So people don't like that. They want to be rubbed on the back. So out of the 100 people, you're going to get... 30 who come to me, 30 who go here, 30 go there. 30. And that could be personality. The coaching might be better for them. If you're a rubber guard player and you, you I'm probably not the guy you would go to. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. You would go to someone who plays that game. I can teach you all that stuff, but you're probably going to go to someone who uses it a lot and stuff, you know? Um, if you're a top game player who likes to wrestle, you're probably going to think I'm better than going to somewhere that does a lot of git. Whatever it might be, right? Mm. You're just going to be, it could be that my personality suits you better. You don't like mind being called a cunt. Like, <laughs> it, it, whatever it might be, you're just going to enjoy being here more. And in, conversely, you might enjoy being somewhere else more. And I'm completely happy with that. It's, mm. Listen, we have phenomenal jujitsu. Ju Pedro, obviously, a brilliant jujitsu gym. Great. If you were going to do gi, go to Pedro's. I, I'm like, go Pedro. The gi is amazing, right? Um, we got Rich and Mark, who have just opened their place, RR, yep. right? Awesome place. Amazing place. It's not like, listen, I'm not going to even say like, oh, come here, it's better there. It's an amazing place. Go there. 100% go there. Like, some of my guys go there when we haven't got class. Go there. It's an amazing place. They're both great guys. Mark Hibbs is pushing it harder than anyone in Bristol right now. Go to RR. Definitely. We have Hodger Gracie. Like, Clayton and them guys are amazing. Like, Go there. Like, if you want to compete in a gi at a high level, what I've heard they're doing with their comp team is phenomenal. Has Will broken right? it down, what they do? Yeah, yeah, it? Will's broken it down. Also, I've seen how your game's developed. Like, <laughs> so, okay, you still come to me with some no-gi stuff and I can make corrections of it, of course, but I've seen how your game's developed. They know how to do jujitsu, right? Mm. There's so many amazing places that you can go. Oh, um, what are they called? Even Mike, Rich and Gary. Oh, um, I'm not going to not mention them as well. Chet Matt. Um, they're Chet, Chet Matt, they're called something else. Elite, 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 elite MMA, that was it. Is it Elite MMA, yeah? yeah. Elite MMA, right? Now, go to them guys, 100%. Like, they're all capable of giving you amazing jiu-jitsu. If you live in Avonmouth and it takes you an hour and five minutes to drive to me in rush hour, don't come here. <laughs> I'm not that much better that it's worth sitting in the traffic for an hour and five minutes. If you want to learn, bad enough as if it you want to learn no gi with wrestling takedowns, drive the extra hour and five minutes. Yeah. I'll, I'll be honest and say that, right? But otherwise, stay there. They're brilliant jiu-jitsu players. They're good coaches. Like... If it suits you better, however, if you like my personality, you like the way that I teach, you like that Chris is always going to be making inappropriate jokes, <laughs> like, the hour and five minutes is worth the drive, definitely, yeah. you know? Just go to some of these amazing places because we have got amazing jiu-jitsu and every single one of them you can learn from and they all deserve you to go through the gym. It's that simple. And I, I include us with that as well, do you know? Yeah. I, I think we all deserve your support. We all deserve your help. We, you can learn from each and every one of us. Don't get trapped into this thing of like, oh yeah, I train here and it's better. It's not. It's that simple. It, it's not better. It's different and it suits you. 
that is it, you know? Yeah. Like, if you give me 10 people from Hod from Hodger Gracie's, 10 people from Mark's, 10 people from Sweatbox, 10 people from Riches, and I give you 10 people, I guarantee you not one gym is going to take all 10, no, yeah. 10 gold med medals, right? It won't because everybody's different. So just go somewhere. If you enjoy it and you love it, keep going there. If you don't like going there, leave and go somewhere else if it suits you better. It's that simple. It's... No one's pinning you down. <laughs> and if they it. are, it's a cult. <laughs> yeah, if, if they are. And listen, this goes to, to the coaches at those places, some of them as well. Like, I'm like, Mark, for instance, comes here and trains. So, mate, i got this coming up. Can I come and get some rounds in and stuff? Yeah, wicked. When he got into the legs, mate, I really need some leg pressure. Can you come and do some leg... If I come, will you put me under leg pressure? 100% I will. So, Mark would do that. Now, these coaches, some of them, listen, drop your ego. You're holding your students back. Send them to where the best wrestling is if they need wrestling. Send them to where the best nogi is for top pressure. Or it might not be that I'm a better nogi coach than you. You have six people turn up to your nogi and they're all purple belts in below. I have 15 turn up to my nogi. They're all blue belts and above, most of them brown belts. Send them here. 100% send them here, right? That's coaches and fighters. Both of you, you both have a responsibility to the student and to yourself. Invest in your game, and as long as you're tell your coach you're coming, don't stitch anybody up. Never try and steal a uh, somebody from somebody's school. Never go behind somebody's back. Don't slag your coach off. You come through my door and you slag your coach off. I'll kick you out of the gym. Simple. I'm not interested. Don't slag your coach off. Say you prefer it if you want. If you do those things, share. Let's all let's all, let's all get better, right? Let's all get better. No, yeah, that makes sense. I think, obviously, with your expertise and how far you've been, well, how long you've been in the game for, you've probably seen some trends that have come and gone and stuff like this. Um, do you think is, is, is going around in a big circle in terms of, like, what is the favourite sort of style or what the ways of sort of teaching is type thing? Like, uh, the one thing I kind of refer to is, like, the UFC, like, it seems to go through a stand-up era, then the, yeah. then the grapplers come back in that goes to the grappler yeah. era, and then it goes back to stand-up again. Yeah. Like, so, we're in the leg lock thing, right? <laughs> that, that, the leg locks, that's your example. Yeah. 100%, right? The leg locks. Now, the leg locks are yesterday, really. Like, people are just picking up on it because now people are nailing it in comps. But it's 10 years old. Like... The good guys, John and those guys, have been teaching it 10 years ago at a high level. Gordon's been nailing it for years. Ash has been smashing the leg. People people are using the leg game to take the back and stuff now. Not even using the leg game to play legs anymore. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like, So it will, of course, because what happens is it gets stale and somebody has to find another way of making something work, um, which is how we evolve the sport. And you end up with things like buggy chokes and all this sort of stuff, do you know what I mean? Like, all the plethora of... Do well, this is the thing. Are there many leg locks that don't have a Japanese name? No. They've all pretty much got yeah, a Japanese name. Pretty much, yeah. right? Well, that's because they've been around for hundreds and thousands of years. There's nothing new. Like, <laughs> they got Japanese names because the Japanese were doing them when it was Jiu-Jitsu years ago. Yeah. They're not new, right? The setups are new. The modifications are new. I would like to see a samurai in a saddle position with a heel hook before being stabbed in the head. Yeah, the there is that. <laughs> I'm not saying they came from that. They definitely came from grappling. But, um, yeah, they got Japanese names because they come from traditional things. So they've been around for years and years. Like, so... It's just the, the way that it's evolved to getting them because it went stale and people started working on so it and moving what, on. What happened with the Dean Lister era? Because yeah. if I'm honest, he had, a, he had a moment where he was the guy fucking the guy. ripping everyone's yeah, fucking legs off. And then would it be Lachlan Giles would be the next person to come after him type of thing to try and do it? Because it always seems to be like a couple of standout guys. It never seems to be like the whole fucking plethora. No, like... I think it would probably been, uh, it would have probably gone Polaris, like Rufamir Polaris. Mm. So it would have gone... Uh, probably Dean Rusamir Polaris was ripping people's legs off in UFC etc yep. Lachlan like now obviously in the big grappling scene probably um, so I trained with Dean when I did the Ultimate Fighter Dean was uh, one of oh, Frank Mir's coaches let's bring that up because like uh, I said I know obviously you, you went to do the Ultimate Fighter didn't yeah. you <laughs> so, like, so sorry it was it was sorry it was um uh, Frank Mir and Robert Drysdale Robert Drysdale would train with Dean so Afterwards, I went and trained with them guys, and so I trained with Dean and I trained with um, Robert and all those all those guys out there. Um, so we were doing legs way back then, but I didn't have it in my game because it used to be banned at a lot of schools. You couldn't do heel hooks and stuff in a lot of jujitsu places. Yeah. yeah, back ten years, fifteen years ago, you wouldn't you'd roll no leg locks. 
and you've looked, yeah, well, I wouldn't crank them up. Yeah, well, if someone rolls the wrong way, they'll hurt there, which is true, but now it's accepted because people are understanding them more. Is that the same at the MMA clubs as well? In terms yeah. of like, they just wouldn't allow leg locks. Yeah, sure. you'd, you were allowed to go for them, but you'd have to stop or something. But yeah, no leg locks and it would be stopped. You would, you would very rarely see people rolling across the mats unless it was pro sparring. So if it was like pro MMA sparring or comp grappling sparring, you would see it. But in classes, they'd say no, no, no heel hooks. Yeah, yeah not, no leg locks. Straight foot locks, that's it. Um, so I trained with them guys out there a year, many years ago, talking 2008, 9, 10, that sort of era, era. And I picked up leg lock game then nowhere near as evolved as it is now and I probably was a bit like this stuff shit someone would just punch you in the face if you go for <laughs> just naive and ignorant <laughs> you know what I mean there's that real going on at the moment it's like someone gets you in the leg lock game this is what you do yeah. there's a segment from combat jiu yeah. just someone just knocking uh, yeah, you yeah 100% yeah right? don't use it on a fucking street in a street fight 100% yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Imanari rolls someone yeah <laughs> yeah but so when like the ultimate fighter um how that came about. I don't know if you want me to touch on that. Yeah, yet. go on. No, it's, it's a great story. Like, so, bit, so, did, did they reach out to you? No. Or so what happened was, a thing came online. Ultimate Fighter tryout deadline next week. So I'm like, I look at it and it's like, you have to submit a video and you have to do this, you have to do that, blah, blah, blah. Or there's open tryouts in the States in Boston this date. So I rang my dad. I was like, dad, I'm busy at the moment. Can you go online and see how much a flight is to Boston for these dates, please? And price up how much it's going to cost me. He's like, what? I was like, I'm going to go to Boston and I'm going to compete in the Ultimate Fighter tryouts. He's like, what are you on about? Because you don't know what any of it is. He knows a fight. Don't yeah. He's like, don't know what any of it is. So he goes on. He's like, right, look, we can go to there and we can get there. I was like, we? He goes, yeah, I'm going to come. I was like, <laughs> all right. <laughs> so he's never been to Boston. So he's like, oh, I was like, all right. So anyway, we book it. We fly over and... Uh, we get there about three days before. He goes, what do you think this is going to involve? I was like, I think I'm going to have to just hit some pads, maybe spar with some people and grapple or something, then have an interview. I think that's what it is. I said, but nobody's ever done it before. He's like, what do you mean? I was like, no one from the UK has ever done it. He's like, what? I was like, no, like Mike Bispin in Ross Point, and they came to the UK and found them. They yeah. did tryouts here. I was like, no one's ever done this. He's like, are you mental? You could have come all this way for nothing then. I was like, so what? Like, so, <laughs> then, lost, um, <laughs> so then it was the day of the thing. We go in and we're all getting talked talk to by like producers and that about what the drill is. And there's hundreds of people, hundreds and hundreds of guys there, mate. And so, because there's two weight categories, obviously. So yeah. we're like hundreds of guys. So my dad's like, this is going to be ours. He's like, I'm going to go off and get us a coffee and stuff like that. So he goes away, he comes back and he's gone away and he's had a shirt made up with England on it and stuff. He's like, <laughs> wear this in because yeah. then you're going to stand out I'll see the England and stuff. I was like, when I speak might be a giveaway, but okay. <laughs> so I put, I got this, I, he went and got this t-shirt made for me and stuff. So I did that and then um, went into the room and uh, there's like, first of all, you go in, there's a table. A guy called Craig who's a producer. Dana White, Joe Silva, someone else. So you have to go along and introduce yourself. Of course, you walk out and we shake Dana. So he goes, hey, kid, uh, Wes? I'm like, Wes? I'm like, yeah, yeah I'm Wes. Um, he goes, where are you from? I was like, I'm from England. He's like, oh, how long have you been out here? I was like, two days. He goes, what do you mean? I was like, I'm over here for this. He's like, what? I said, I've come here for this. He like, looked at that Craig. He goes, you fucking flew here for this? I was like, <laughs> yeah, it's the only place that's happening, right? So I didn't have a choice. So I'm not going to send you a tape. And the, that Craig go guy the producer guy goes um you sound irish i was like you sound canadian <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, yeah, like smiled and laughed and then so we had to roll and i was like right don't give me a wrestler please don't give me a wrestler please don't give me a wrestler so we come out and it was start on your knees i was like hey so anyway this wrestler comes at me as he comes i like i run on his knees i fall underneath and i kick leg i took an arm bar 14 seconds take an arm bar and all i heard was dana went whoa um you guys better go again I thought, like, we might as well start stood up. He had wrestling boots on this guy. So we start stood up. I took him down, passed, and uh, passed. And I subbed him with, uh, I think, maybe a head and arm. Um, so then the next bit was an, an interview, then hitting pads. I knew I could look good on pads, definitely. Then they had a spar a little bit. So I did all that. And then they were like, listen, guys, if you can't come to Las Vegas on Monday, um, put your hand up. So they called out a load of names. They called my name out. I'm like, sat on my hands like this. No one I fly home on Sunday. I'm like, sat on my hands like this. Like, um. So then they call me, she called me, a woman called Jamie, called me over and she goes, hey, where's some, um, are you go, are you okay to fly? I was like, well, I'm meant to be flying home on Sunday. She's like, no worries. Look, what we'll do is we'll pay for your hotel in Boston. We'll book your flight to Las Vegas. Nice. I was like, 
okay, so they flew me there, and they flew me out a week. Like they flew me out there on the Monday, but they flew me out for a week longer than everybody else because uh, so I was out there for two weeks. Can we spend the money and stuff? Nice. And did interviews there, did medicals, had to go and do some more training in front of them and that. And that was it, mate. Yeah, that was away. That was awesome. That was in. I know you had the unfortunate. You had the um, injury, obviously, in your fight and stuff, which is obviously killer yeah. and stuff when it came to it. But um, still, a, a story to tell the grandkids, you kind of say, type of thing. I, like, I mean. You can you can look at fights that you've won and things like this and okay I had that opportunity and Dana was wicked like it was Manchester not long after and uh, Dan Hardy fought on the card and I cornered Chris Lytle um, and then I was there and I, I'm at the ball I'm like the the where the fighters sit like cage side and, yeah. and Dana went Kit because you're from the Ultimate Fighter I was like yeah because Wes right I'm like yeah I was like yeah how are you he's like I'm good how's your leg and I was like this is like a year later maybe I'm like. Fuck, like he remember, remembered. I was like, fair play. Like, you yeah. remembered that, do you know what I mean? He goes, have, uh, have you been in touch with our guys? You still? I was like, yeah, I've not fought yet because of my leg. He's like, shit, man. And, you know, the injury was quite bad. It was mm. like I'd done two ligaments in my foot. Didn't fight for 13 months or something Jesus. afterwards. And he's like, he said, Joe been in touch? I was like, oh, I've spoke to Joe. And so he goes, make sure you stay in touch, kid. And, like, we, like, had a little chat and stuff. I was like, fair play, he remembered. And then a couple of years later, they came back again. He remembered me again, just stood around, like, just from stood around. I was with Ken Pavia and stuff, so I was like backstage and that. And the, he remembered me again. I was like, that's pretty cool. But look, it's one of those things where I would have liked to have won the fight. I'd have liked to have gone forward. I'd like to have been in the UFC. But my career can be defined by the things I didn't do. It can be defined by the things that I did do. It's the first guy to ever fly to the Amer to America, compete in the Ultimate Fighter, get into the Ultimate Fighter, have a shitstorm of a performance, but I got in, right? Yeah. Like, you can keep defining yourself by the, what could have been in the things you didn't do, mm -hmm. or you can define yourself by the things that you have done. And for me, I've done some pretty cool stuff. For me, nobody else has to appreciate it, but for me, I've done some pretty cool stuff. There's something mentally rewarding about flying there on your own when no one else has ever done it then having to get on a plane and fly to las vegas with no corner team not knowing who the other guys are in the house not knowing who you're going to fight but knowing you're willing to fight whoever they put in front of you back in them days it was something quite rewarding about for me about that like about who i became as a person yeah. being willing to do those things and i say this a lot when people ask me like if you could have it your time do you wish you could come around now when it's all famous or back in the day i'm like when, when I had my time, like the fact that referees tried to stand me up because they didn't realize the rules and stuff. And like, you know, like that was, people were booing when you were on the floor. People would say, yeah, ground and pound when you're punching someone on the fence and stuff. Like, <laughs> I'm glad I had that. I'm glad yeah. I seen the, the start of it, you know? So yeah, you just, you got to do this shit for you. I tell people all the time, if you're doing it for the pats on the back or you're doing it to be the most famous guy in the room, you're in the wrong game, man. You're going to lose brain cells and, you know, like I used to be really pretty, mate, and look at me now. Do you know what I mean? Like, if you're doing it for the wrong reasons, it's the wrong game. Fair enough. Um, I'll maybe put a vote out and say, obviously, where's back in the day versus now. We'll see, obviously, what the what the votes come out. <laughs> I like. can tell you that. <laughs> I can tell you the answer to that, mate. I do, I would I would love to fight me back in the day right now. <laughs> Forty year old me would have beat twenty five year old me. I can assure uh, you. Fine wine, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, there's a good question because obviously you went out. And obviously did more than what was expected, obviously, with the fact that there, like you flew from from the UK to come and do mm. this. There's definitely a bit of consensus of a lot of go fund my dreams to go to the world type thing, right? And I'd like to say that I think most of the immediate people that we both know within the circles haven't ever asked for a handout in the slightest yeah. bit. But it seems to be very common now that, hey, I want to go to the world. Can you please fund this for me? Yeah. <sighs> Where do you think that culture's come from? Because obviously you you had that moment then, as you just mentioned, like, hey, we're going out to Boston, hey, we'll sort this out another yeah. time type thing. Is it society's change that people are just expecting instant gratification or instant handouts all the time? And like, I'm not saying where's the blame for it type of thing, but what's your thoughts on that scenario altogether? Um, I think uh, like we live in a world where people want quick reward. Mm. So you want to post a video, you want to get 100 likes, everyone tell you you're brilliant and you actually believe them and they've seen 43 seconds of your game. So they see 43 seconds of your overall jiu-jitsu game, they tell you you're an amazing at jiu-jitsu, you believe them because they like you on Instagram. Like it's instant gratification for nonsense. And I think it's the same with this GoFundMe nonsense. Now, for me, GoFundMe is for someone who's been it off their bike, they had 
uh, brain troubles, their family are now struggling to fund their, I'll help you out every day. Do you know what I mean? Like, of course. Am I helping, like, Jane, who's a blue belt, she wants to go worlds, uh, can you help me fund, it's going to cost me two and a half grand. Yeah, do you want motherfucker, it's going to cost everyone two and a half grand. That's called sacrifice. Like, what you do is, you work two jobs if you have to, and you save the money. So when I fought pro MMA, I worked on the door. So I was working on the door six days a week, and I owned this gym. So I was working in here in the day, and I was working on the door six nights a week, and I was training full time. Want to know why? Because there was no fucking money. Like... So I had to fund my lifestyle. Mm. So when I wanted to do these things, I would have to do it. Like, I won't ask anyone for a handout ever. Like, I'm not. It's, that, that's just not my way. And look, if you've got, if you're surrounded by people who are willing to put their hand in their pocket and give you money, and that's how you want to live your life, that's fine. But I think if you're willing to come to a gym, get sweaty every day, get beat up, get your face ground on, like, do all that surely you're willing to put the extra effort in to get yourself to where you want to be, right? It's that good old phrase of the sort of saying, if you start on a 6am jiu-jitsu class type thing, the rest of the day is going to be an absolute fucking doddle for you. Yeah, I nothing... mean, don't get me wrong, everyone knows I'm not up at 6am <laughs> jiu-jitsu. I'm not an early morning. I get up at 5am to go to work a lot of the time, but I'm not coming in here a lot. Of the... I did the other week for Mark at 7am, Mark Hibbs. We did a session for 7am for him, and I could feel that I was up at 7am. I mean, I was like, this is not a good idea. Um... But yeah, it's true. Like, are you just, you were, you were, I mean, so right now, so I've written a book, my book's ready for publish, it's gone through all the editing, and I've spoke to some publishers, and I speak about literary agents and that, but realistically, I need to fund it myself, mm. because the publishing deals are crap. Now, I could put a GoFundMe out, saying, look, I've written this book, blah, 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 here. And I won't do it. People say, you should do it. And what you should do is, when people give you the money, you should say, right, if you pay for your first copy up front, when it goes to print, I'll send you the copy. It feels too much like a handout to me. Mm. It feels too much like, look, like I've written a book. I need to find a way now to get it published, right? So the book should have been published maybe eight months ago. I've not done it because I don't have the money yet. So I'm going to keep working. I put a little bit of money in a pot every single month towards funding it. And I will get my book released. But I'm not putting a thing up on Facebook saying, help me fund my book. Like, mm. And people said, yeah, but it's not handout because people can just pay you for their copy up front and you give them the copy once it goes to print. And I get it, but it still feels a bit like, yeah. help me. And uh, look, I'm not, I'm not going to, my days of criticising people for doing, for how they want to do things. You do that if that's what you want to do. Is not what I like. It's not the way that I I still think you're going to get the same satisfaction coming towards the end of it. Yeah. And then I, what, I think I, the, the, those people will. I wouldn't. You wouldn't. I, I just. I think also then likewise, like you're going to put yourself in the same detriment because guess what? Worlds happens every fucking year. Yeah. Yeah. So if you can't afford it one year, what's going to happen the next year? Yeah. When yeah. you haven't learned how to save for the fucking money, like let's be real, you go win Worlds one year, you're not going to get like unlimited sponsorship. Nowadays, sponsorships like oh, we'll send you a bit of clothing and that's it. They're not yeah, going to exactly. pay for you, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. Unless you are literally like I don't know. Colabate, for example, right, where people want to be sponsoring him, type of yeah, thing, yeah. and they'll fund this type of stuff. And there are some good companies that are doing that, for example, or help other people. Like I'm aware, uh, Scramble, for example, paying for some of the guys that they work with and that type of stuff to help fund them to go to the USA and all that type of jazz type but stuff. But Scramble aren't funding nobody. Fucking <laughs> Ricky, who goes to three sessions a week and is going to fucking worlds for the first time. They're funding full-time dedicated athletes yeah. like this is one thing that really pisses me off about your white collar boxers your amateur mma fighters not all of them i'm generalizing um your ju lots of your jiu-jitsu players they train like once a day and they're telling everyone yeah couldn't have done more training out like no 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 <laughs> six hours a day six days a week was what i trained as a full-time pro mma fighter I know how, how my level was compared to everybody else in the world because I went around the world and I trained with the highest level guys. Like, I know I've trained in the same room as GSP. I know how hard he's working. I know I'm doing the same. I've been next to Anderson Silva sparring on the same mat. I know what these guys are doing. I know I'm doing the same work as them. You're not doing that. There's not, you fucking white collar guys who are saying, yeah, no, but start criticizing what fucking Canelo's doing or something. Yeah, what I think, and I'm like, you don't know, you're not, you're not in the same league. You're not even doing what an amateur boxer's doing. Stop the nonsense. The only people you're fooling, like, people do it now. I commentate their fights, so they'll tag me and stuff when they put up. And, and sometimes they put stuff up, and I'm like, the only people you're fooling with this nonsense 
It's the people who don't know what they're on about anyway. And yeah. their opinion doesn't count for anything. So it's like the guys who fight a guy who's 0-3. First pro fight, fighting a guy who's 0-3. Right? Yeah, this is going to be a tough fight. Um, this this guy's got really good this. Really good. I'm like, listen, the only people who are falling for this are the people who don't know to check topology. Like, anybody who knows what they're on about is going to look at the guy and say, hang on a minute, you've had X amount of MMA fights. This guy's had, he's 0-3 at MMA. You're fi- what is going on here, you know? Like, the same match that when you see them have only Muay Thai fights, for example, and they go into an MMA match. And yeah, get like, double well, edge show yeah. <laughs> And you've got guys who are 40 now, like 40, 41 years old or whatever, and they're like, yeah, training my ass off, going to step in, going to do this, rah, 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 first turning pro or doing this, and I'm watching them, and I'm like, fair play, yeah, no, like, do it. It's, it's for everybody. Go, challenge them. And then they put up who they're fighting, and I'm like, hang on a minute, you're fighting a bum. Yeah, but I'm 40 to... No, hang on a minute. No, no, no. No, no. If you're fighting a guy with a losing record, and because you're 40, don't fight. Mm. Don't fight. Like, fight a guy who's equally matched as you, maybe even a little bit tougher. You've got no career ahead of you. Yeah. Don't promote on Instagram that you've got this, yeah, I've trained my ass off. I'm this, oh, I've really dedicated myself 40 years old and I've really proved age is just a number. And I'm fighting a donut who's 0 in 7. Like, you're not proving anything to anyone. It's like, the same as going into, I don't know, fighting a white belt all of a sudden. Not to say obviously on that level, but then you're going to say, oh, I've got a super fight with a white belt and I'm a purple belt or something along those lines. Uh, and yeah. then going, this is going to be amazing. This I've worked really hard for it. Like, well, everyone's got to work hard for it. Like, it's not. Exactly. <laughs> it's no different. Yeah, just, you know, like, you're, the only people you fool, don't, this is a little message to all of you guys out there, okay? <laughs> the only people you're fooling out there are the people who don't count. Everyone else thinks you're a twat. It's that simple. If you're in the sport and you see that, we're all thinking, oh, shut up, mate. You're embarrassing yourself. Like, the only people who are patting you on the back are the idiots. It's yeah. that simple. It's that simple. Um, now, next question I've got is quite an interesting one. So I know we haven't always agreed with certain things, obviously, with nutrition related mm-hmm. and stuff like that, which is fine. Everyone can yep. have their own opinions and views on stuff. You've obviously been in the game for a long time. And one of the things which, speaking to other nutritionists, dietitians and stuff, that it definitely seems that there's been sort of head figures for like who was leading the nutrition scene yeah. obviously for mma jiu-jitsu that type of thing and there seems to be a trend that they stay relevant for quite some time they're the guys to go to take lock Hart, for example and then they get chopped down by someone else yeah. and then someone fills their shoes eventually and then they stand up and see the prominent figure and then they get chopped down for one thing or another <sighs> what do you feel like is is it them putting their head above the parapet to kind of say, look, we're leading the way with this for them to sort of be open to this criticism? Or do you feel like sometimes, because when we look at the research and stuff, we just, there's not, we can't ever grab like 200 plus MMA fighters who want to go for a weight cut on one day type yeah. thing. Never have that there to back it up. So where do you think, we, I don't know how to add this question to be fair. Why do you think they're getting cut down all the time? So I think a lot of it is everyone wants to be famous. Um, okay. So they talk bollocks to try and make yourself be famous. Mike Dolce would be your number one most yeah, famous so guy, he, right? he came up with another one before. Now, listen, Mike's a lovely guy. I've met Mike yeah. a couple of guy- times, right? Mike's a lovely guy. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So, Mike Dolce, the Dolce diet, well, then that's where he fucked it. Because none of, none of nutrition guys, I'd say you guys, because you're a nutrition, yeah. nobody wants to admit, actually, we're all fucking doing the same stuff. Like, some of us are a bit more scientific in that we look, break down the molecular structures of lipids and we look at this, which is nonsense really, because your layman doesn't need to know it. If you want to know that, that's fine. <laughs> um, it's the same as if I learned the geometry of jujitsu. It's not relevant. I need to know how to put my leg over your head, right? So <laughs> Biomechanics of breaking. Yeah, but if you want to do that, that's perfectly fine. I'm a bit of a weird geek when it comes to stuff that I like. I like knowing stuff that's going to bear. When I go paragliding, like the aspect ratio of certain wings, the way that it's trimmed, it's going to make no difference to how I fly my paraglider. But I like to know them. You you are the same with this, let's say. But you do some really cool things, like when you post about the monster drinks that you have and stuff. Like, look, there's no nutritionist in the world should be promoting you drinking monster because it's fucking terrible for you. It's chemicals. But it's not going to make you fat. Mm. If you're looking at a nutrition point of view of will I put on weight and stuff, no. Should I put loads of chemicals in my body? No, but that's different arguments. Like, Mm -hmm. we're not having a processed food versus a non-processed food argument. But you know that. You and your aunt telling people, this monster's healthy for you. You're like, look, you can drink monsters. They taste nice and it's not going to hurt you. You can have full-fat Coke if you want. You can eat fries if you want. Now, what it comes down to is this. Why are you 
why are you studying nutrition? What do you want? Do you need to cut weight for a fight? Because if you're cutting weight for a fight, that's not the same as being on a diet, mm -hmm. right? Uh, a weight cut diet or the weight cut nutrition is completely different and it's a science that should be reserved for people who are making weight. You lose weight as quick as possible, you put weight on as quick as possible. That is it. Yep. No twins about it. I don't, if you've got to fight at 70 kilos, you've got to win at 70 kilos on the Friday and you are 79 kilos four weeks out, we're not starting a diet yet. Don't start your diet. Oh, but I'm worried. No, no, no. Listen, mm, brother, you're going to come in way too low. You're going to start to deplete muscle. You're going to start to, unless you're a chub, chub and you could maybe eat <laughs> 65. We don't want to do that yet. We want to keep you heavy at this point. This is my argument. Your intensity at training at that point should be picking up and up and up yeah. and up and up. And what's going to be worse is that you've got fuck all food in you, high intensity training. It's basically pure category for injury to come up or something like exactly this. Exactly that. Yeah. And especially because you're not going to recover very well. <laughs> and the, everybody can train as hard. There's nobody who can train harder than anybody else. Everybody can. Can you recover? This is what it comes down to. <laughs> Recovery is more important than training, right? Yeah. Everyone can do the same sort of output, but you we need to recover. recover. You need to replenish that body, right? So if you've got someone who's depleting their calories and you've got someone who hasn't, the chances are the person who's not depleting is going to be able to sustain that output for longer. Yeah. Now, the nonsense comes in when people start saying, oh, yeah, well, what we've got to do is we start dropping all this stuff and we make it this. We make it whoa, 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 whoa. Hang on, hang on, hang on. If you're 79 kilos for your whole fight, for your whole life, you're going through fight camp, you're maintaining 79 kilos, keep doing what you're doing. Eat exactly what you're eating, don't change anything. Are you getting muscle strains? Are you getting pulls? Are you getting fatigue? No. Do what you're doing. Mm. Yeah, but I live on pizzas and fries. Yeah, do that. Because that's what you're doing. When we come to cutting our weight, we'll make adjustments. Yeah. When we make adjustments, I'll make adjustments based on, my only difference for me and other people will be, my adjustments will be based on food you like eating. I don't want to cut out all you like eating and put you on tuna and lettuce. Fish and rice. Because you'll, you'll hate it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You'll hate that, right? Yep. So you won't want to do it anymore and you'll cheat on it and you'll start messing up. So I'll try and base my weight cut around what you like to eat because it's going to be easier for you. Sure. Um, what people try and do is they try and label what they're doing and make it something so they can sell it and market it. Like, yeah. And people want to be known as being the best at something. Let, I'll, I'll be honest with you, mate, and... You might not like it. You might agree with it. I don't, I don't know because I've not said it, but I have coached more people to make fight weight than you. Yeah, I right. agree with that. We yeah. know that, right? Yeah. So we know that. So I know for a fact how to make people make fight weight. I did it even last two weeks ago. I've done it to somebody, right? I know how to do it. There's no two ways about it. It doesn't mean that you don't know how to do it and your way won't do it. 100%. You can get people. You're a nutritionist. You know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Don't try and make it overcomplicated. Don't try and make it a new way to sell product or to make money. Because what you'll do is you'll alienate all the actual people who know what they're on about. And they'll be like, what an idiot. He's trying to fucking make money off of the thing that we already know how to do. Mm. Right? Stick to being honest and open about your nutrition and say, look, I can get you on weight. And I can probably get you on weight healthier than a lot of other people because I understand nutrition. But I'm not, I'm not creating something new. I just studied something that you didn't. This is a good question for you. So there's definitely been probably a shift, I'd say, in the weight cut week, right? Yep. Especially as we've seen, obviously, some of the extreme cases of, uh, let's just say Darren Till, for example. Yeah, yeah. There was obviously the one Bellator guy who I think, did he die from it? Or he's yeah, been the, the young viciously kidding. sick, I yeah, think it was. Uh, and like, it was being, that one he, guy died, didn't he? One guy's Recently, died, but yeah. this is a scary thing. More people have died from weight cuts than they have been in the fucking ring. Yeah, yeah, thing, yeah, which yeah, is yeah, awful to say. Yeah. But there definitely seems to be that, again, even at the, on the local promotion, speaking to one guy who shifted 10 kilograms on the day before type thing and been doing it all morning. And I was like, okay, what's your rehydration strategy? What's your refuel strategy? Yeah. Oh, just a cup of Delora. Like, I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. Right. Um, and just did nothing in the fight week. When do you, did you feel like there was a shift between let's just sweat the fuck out of everything and then actually we can do a little bit with your food? Was there ever sort of a transition with that or was it just some clubs were doing it more than others? Or? Yeah, so what happened, it came from wrestling, right? People for wrestling back in the oh, high school wrestling weekend, with Jesus. dehydrate. Yeah. So they just knew I can't keep dieting my weight off. I'm, I'm going to get to a point where I can't diet anymore. So I've got to rely on water loading. So that's how it came about when, when weight cutting started, came from then. But then you've got people who realise, right, I'm only fighting four times a year, so how can I make myself lose this weight and have as least an impact on the water as possible? Mm. I could diet, actually, and I could get to a better weight by diet. Or, actually, I'm fighting too high a weight. I could lose these six kilos of water. I know I can do that. But I've also got five kilos of fat I could lose, so I can go to weight 
class below, you yeah. know? So that, that played a part. Um, people being a bit more serious about it, a bit more dedicated. Um, the most I've ever cut is 9.8 kilos of water. That came out at about 5.9 on the day. Uh, the, on the morning of wake up, I woke up and had 5.9 left to go. Yeah. I've seen Paul Reed do 6.2 on the day of water because he ate sushi the night before. We were in Sweden and he was like, I got this much to go. Can I eat something? I was like, you can. I said, but we need to stay away from salt. I said, you need to stay away from anything that's going to spike your insulin. We need to stay. Right, okay. He had sushi and, and fucking soy sauce. So, 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 yeah, I was so. like, what have you done? He said, oh, I was like, so it spiked. He, he would have had about 4.8. You wake up at like 6.2, he had to go. Didn't lose any water overnight. So I've seen people do big weight cuts. I mean, I like Peter Sabota did a massive weight cut once in Sweden. But when I did that weight cut, I put an IV in. Like I right. did, I, I knew I had an IV. I knew I could go heavy with the weight cut. I knew I'd hate it. I did a weight cut in Dominican Republic. Um, I woke up after water loading, everything excreting water. Um, I woke up and I had something like 3.8, I want to say, to go. Perfect, I'm over the moon with that. That's an easy way yeah. to do the weight. I'm on weight. Go down, I weigh on the scales. Scales are weighing me a kilo over. I was like, What? <laughs> I was like, No, I've got other scales. Like, they're like, They're the scales, Wes, for cage rage. They're the scales. We're weighing on them scales. I was like, Listen, I've got two sets of scales. They both. So I go back up to the room. I cut the other kilo, right? Go back down. They moved the scales. I weighed a kilo under. So I'd cut the extra kilo for nothing. They'd move the scales. Cut it for nothing, mate. So I did four point, I think four point eight, four point seven. I done on the day. Paul Reed, like next to me. I don't think I was in the Dominican Republic in a suite in the <laughs> Hard Rock Hotel. It wasn't the worst weight cut of my life. But that was probably six, seven kilos all in in the last yeah. like forty out, thirty five hours or something. Big weight cuts. Um, I am not an advocate of weight cuts. We should stop doing weight cuts. We should be weighing somebody three times on fight week, and you have to be within five pounds of your fight weight on fight week. Um, that for me is the only way. You can't weigh people as they go in the cage. People are fight dehydrated. Yep. You can't, and you have to have five pounds because when you start eating differently, you'll get spikes in your yeah. like the way you hold water. So five pound fluctuation over a week period. That's your fight. You have to still weigh seventy kilos, but you got to be five pounds within for the week. Let's say let's That's stop people cutting weight. Do you know what I mean? Let's stop it. Interesting with the three because that actually puts a different spin on stuff. Because I know obviously within the professional boxing route, within certain federations, they'll do a pre fight weigh in. Yep. It was obviously not the actual weigh in itself, but it would be like two or three weeks out. Yep. What it transpired was a lot of these boxers were basically just doing weight cuts twice over. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it was then making them even That's more. That's why you fucked. need the extra weight cut. Yeah. That's why you need the extra. Like, if you're doing Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you're not doing that. Your body yeah, you won't part with it. No. Your body won't excrete the water the next time. You'll right. start feeling. So you do three: Monday, Wednesday, Friday. The only the only reason it can't work in lower level is nobody's going to fund the weight cut. So in the UFC, you can do it because they'll fly people there a week before. Mm. But it won't work at lower levels, obviously, because nobody's going to fund these things. Right. Um, but at lower levels, we still got people with an 0 30 record fighting people with a 10 and 0 record. So we've got bigger problems in the weight cut at the moment. Definitely. It's interesting to say about the IV stuff. So again, when uh, Jacob Couch, I think a couple of years back, mm -hmm. went on, who's number one, and he ended up doing something, I think it was like 15 kilos in like two days or yeah. something stupid like this. Did it all. And like my biggest concern is obviously to the average Joe who may not be completely aware of it, who says, oh, great, I can shift 15 kilograms in two days. It's absolutely fine for my local, I don't know, Bristol Open or something like this. I'm yeah. like, no, don't work like that. And then oddly enough, he went into the IV, got an IV straight afterwards. Met him at Grapple Fest and he said, Oh, yeah, you do know like everyone else from the show basically went on IV straight away. And I'm like, That is a massive, significant difference in terms yeah. of like how you're going to be feeling after that type of thing. And, so like, let's put it this way um, when I would, uh, when I did, so when I fought in Brazil, I did an IV. So I weighed in 70 kilos and this has got to be on weight for three o'clock. I was on weight for three o'clock. We didn't do the open weigh in in the, um, the TV weigh in until 6.30. I was on weight for three and a half hours. Lost the hearing in my left ear. Couldn't Ugh. hear in my left ear. And my eyesight had started to go blurry. And apparently Paul Croft said I was slurring my words. I didn't recognise that. But he said I was slurring my words, right? Three and a half hours on weight. Um, I'd done about four and a half kilos of water on the day in a steam room as well because he didn't have a bath for me. Um, so... Um, I went back to the hotel, I put an IV in, in an hour I'd done four and a half litres um, of Hartman's solution and 5% glucose, plus I'm still sipping water as well. Yeah. Uh, the, so the weigh-in was at 6.30, by 11 o'clock that night I was 79 and a half kilos, woke up next morning I was 82 kilos. So 
because well, I could put an IV in. So yeah. that meant I could cut more water. I could, but my what what the most important thing of that was my brain was getting fluid really quickly instead of it being absorbed through my gut. Yeah. So my brain was getting fluid. They stopped it because it masks like agents, yeah. but at the same time, let's protect people's brains, man. If people want to take fucking drugs, we got to find another way of finding out. Let's protect people's brains before everything. Well, this, let them IV. Or you have to say. You can only IV at the doctor. You have a, you, I'm talking UFC level. Yeah. UFC Bellator. You can have an IV, yes, but it has to be from our doctors. And you come, and you make weight, and you have a room full of people with like lines. And right, boom, you go in an IV. Boom, you go in an IV. Especially now we've got staggered weigh-ins. Yeah. So that's that's something I think that, that could be looked at. Well, this is kind of my argument when it comes to jiu-jitsu athletes as well. Is that don't get me wrong, no one's intending to be kicked or punched in the face, right? Obviously, you get the occasional knee or elbow, but it's just that, again. I told you about the one obviously earlier at the ADCC where you try yeah. to jump on the guy's back and full on face plant yeah, in the yeah. fucking floor. If the guy's obviously dehydrated in the first place, that is going to do more than enough fucking damage, obviously, within your brain as itself, because the fluid's going to be all gone. If well, so it's being choked. Like, yeah. If you're defending a guillotine that's really tight and you're defending it for 40, 50 seconds, that's not good for your brain, no. especially a brain that's been dehydrated. It's not yeah. good. I just think that too many people have that lapse of days attitude about their brain and CTE and... Bra like, I, I think there has to be a responsibility on the fight show... Um, especially at lower levels, we have to, we have to, and I mean, this is hard because I commentate a lot, and so I know low, lower levels, but we have to stop matching people who are unmatched. Like, people who have got an 0 and 10 record against a guy who's 7 and 0, stop it. Stop it right now. You're not benefiting anyone, that has to stop. Someone will get injured soon mm. if you do this. So that has to stop. Also, we have to stop people doing massive weight cuts and fighting. They have to figure out a way because... Look, for 99.7% of everybody who fights, you're never going to make enough money to retire. You're going to need to use your brain. And even if you do make enough money, you still want to enjoy your family, right? I notice the impact that it's had on me. The way when I read, I lose concentration, I get lots of migraines. Now, I've never been knocked out. There's lots of people who we know who have been knocked out mm. over and over again, and it's got a really detrimental effect. I think... What's more important than making money, more important than looking good to your friends, more important is health. Yeah. Right? And there has to be a way of figuring it out. And you, we knew when Peter Belfort was taking drugs. So, no, there's not a uh, IV that's going to mask that. We could tell he was taking drugs, right? So, I think if you can figure it out so that all IVs are administered and they're given by the UFC, they're supplied by the UFC, they're administered by the UFC, you have to go and you have to sit. You're only allowed, let's say you're only allowed two litres. Mm. Your first two initial litres go in and you're sat drinking your diary light at the same time. It's a, it's a step. It's a step in the right direction. Yeah. Right? Something like that has to, has to happen. I well, think. I do know obviously from <clears throat> uh, Matt Benyon at Paris and stuff mm -hmm. and said that he's obviously trying to encourage fighters who are, I don't know, both sitting at 80, and they're like, oh, we'll both fight at 70. And he's like, why? Like, what's the fucking point? You're both exactly the same fucking weight. Yeah. yeah. Like, there's just no need for you to drop weight type thing. And yeah. Like, it's, it's, but... it's, so I've had it before, mate. We've been abroad, and somebody said, like, we've gone, and uh, well, the fights at, say, 70, 77 kilos. We go there, and we're in the morning, like, oh, how much you got to a to weight cut? And the guy would be like, oh, I'm like... 79.5 and I'm like oh we're 79 but do you want to just do you want to just match it that and then go speak to the promoter like advertise it as 77 but we'll just match it 79 kilos neither of them have to cut weight <laughs> or do we just match and the promoter's like yeah right just kept it secret or whatever but that's happened a lot I've done that a lot to people really yeah because fucking right I'm not I'm not interested like you're you're 79 you're 79 and a half stuff it like I'm, I've done it myself mate I'm like and I, you know like when I fought Lawrence Tracy obviously fought the weight category up or whatever and I felt better for not doing the weight cut not doing mm. much but yeah I've done it a few times I just spoke to a promoter and I said look if you want to ma a match at 79 instead promote it at 77 kilo five. we'll just match at 79 if you want and then boom you do it like None of you are in the UFC. None of you are being paid big money. If this promoter and you want to do it, stop drilling your body. For now we're at the point where people want to brag about their weight cuts. Like, oh, water loading, four litres down today. Well, again, you're 25 years into the sport. We've done it all. Nobody cares. You're not doing anything that anybody hasn't done. Shut up. Like, nobody cares that you're water loading and you're cutting weight. People, people treat cutting weight now like the fight. 
They want a pat on the back for making weight. The hard part's done. No, you've got to get in the cage next. <laughs> also, why do you want a pat on the back for the fact that you've done what you signed yeah. up to do? Like, you yeah, know what's happening. Why are you putting it on Instagram? Like, that's the thing that people should sponsor you for. I sponsor this guy because he does six kilos of water. No. What you want to do is, like, be appreciated for how you approach the game. Represent the sport really well. That's why sponsors should be coming in. And sponsoring you, unless you are really funny, like Connor and these guys, and like Craig, right? We, everyone should sponsor people like Craig Jones because he's funny. Don't sponsor Nicky Rod because he's not funny. He's got no personality, but he's a good jujitsu, he's a good grappler. Yeah. Um, but you should sponsor Craig because he can say what he wants because he's funny. The stuff he did with Gabby and those sort of things. He's a humorous, funny guy. Like Jacob Couch is another one. Like if you put him in front of a camera, he's unintentionally <laughs> funny. He's just yeah, no, no idea what's going to come out of his mouth. Yeah, sponsor so. these people. I mean, like, listen, it's like Polaris should definitely have me on the show, right? <laughs> they should, I don't know why I've not been on Polaris yet. They, if they see me grapple, and like Gareth not seen me grapple, they sh I should be on Polaris. They should have said to me, "Look, we have got a no gi match for you by now, definitely." <laughs> um, grapple fest or like no, I've not, but. I think I represent the sport quite well. I'm not on Knowles. I don't talk rubbish. I try and... My fighters, if they do, I pull them straight away. You know there's people who have trained here who yeah. talk nonsense and I'll call them out on it straight away. I don't have it. I'm not having this talking crap. Of course, get the banter going. And, but, but if you start insulting people's family and stuff like that, publicly, I'm on you straight away. Stop that right now. You represent the team. You're not just representing you. Oh, I'm just selling... T I don't sell tickets a different way. Don't do that. You represent the team. You've got to wear the badge out tomorrow. Stop it. It's simple. You can easily say just sell your tickets by your results. Exactly. Yeah. Well, but, but say funny stuff. Insult people. <laughs> Don't insult people's family and stuff like that. And what, like, really? you know, unless you're Sean Strickland, do what you want. Lowers I mean, like, the tone, like, massively with that. But. Um, I know we've been fucking chatting for a long <laughs> fucking time, mate. I don't know how long these usually are, mate, sorry. <laughs> it's fine, it's like two hours plus in, but it's fine. It's all been fucking good so far. Um, I'll probably run through some of the staple... Well, actually, no, I do have one more question. This yep. isn't loaded at anyone intentionally at all because I think there's other clubs, obviously, that come underneath this banner as well, yep. okay? So uh, the one club, obviously, I go to is Elite, right? They're just yep. no-gi only, but they yeah. obviously have belt gradings as well. So what it kind of falls in line with is kind of belt gradings within MMA, yeah. right? Should they be there? Should they not be there? How do you kind of filter that out in terms of like local competitions? You get some people obviously throw their toys out the pram and say, well, that guy's not a white belt, he's a blue belt because he's done like, he's more into MMA, but they don't do MMA, great, great MMA gradings. So they should be fighting like blue belt or whatever type thing. Not aside the pro MMA status type of thing, probably looking at the amateur stuff. What's your thoughts and feelings in sort of belts in MMA then? It's nonsense. Yeah. It's nonsense. Look, uh I mean, look, do it if you want to do it. I don't, I'm not criticising people for doing it, but it doesn't mean anything. Like, you, you can be a purple belt in MMA, but it won't have any relevance to jiu-jitsu. Like, one of our guys went in and trained at Elite the other day. Mike went and trained at Elite the other day. Yeah. He said, mate, they were really solid. Their fundamentals were really good. But, but yeah, do you want to know, want to know why, mate? They're a jiu-jitsu team. They're, and they're not, they're grappling. They're a no-gi yes, team, yeah. right? They're a grappling club. I'm like, that's all they do. I said, lots of our guys here have got very good grappling, but they're MMA grapplers. So they'll get top positions and they'll go where they can land shots and they'll favour knee on belly over other things. I was like, when you go to a strict no-gi club like that, they're very good at that because that's what they do. They stick to that one thing. If you've got a purple belt, it, uh, MMA, right? Are you a purple belt in MMA or, or jiu-jitsu? Well, I'm a purple belt. Yeah, but, but okay, okay, let me stop you two seconds. If you're a purple belt MMA, I'm assuming it's got some relevance on your wrestling, your striking, your kicking, your... Well, yeah. So, can you order your own against purple belts in jiu-jitsu? Well, I've never done jiu-jitsu. Right, well, here's my point then. So, if you're not doing pure jiu-jitsu, your purple belt means nothing when you go to a jiu-jitsu competition, right? It means nothing because, I mean, lots of them don't do it anyway. It doesn't mean anything unless you've got a coach who's gay, gay, uh, gauging you on your jiu-jitsu. If you are, stop giving them a belt in MMA. Give them a belt in jiu-jitsu. That's my take on it, but look, we live in a world where people like to get rewards for things they do. <laughs> and people pay you more money when they get rewards. If you're running a business as a coach, you need to do whatever you can to make your money. Yep. Now, I think people are getting credible belts for what they are. So I, people are a credible purple belt MMA, i.e., right, it's based on this, 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 and this. Yeah, that's credible. That person represents that really well. I'm not saying you're giving it as a not credible belt, but you accept it doesn't mean anything, right? Doesn't mean anything. 
nothing for anybody but that person who's getting a reward. I'm, your, your, your syllabus for what you've given it is all very well and I agree with it. That person represents that and they should get that purple belt based on that. But it just doesn't mean anything. So this, purple can walk, this person can walk around with their purple t-shirt on all very well. Don't mean absolutely anything outside of that room that you're in. Nobody anywhere on the, in the world is looking at you and said, oh, he's a purple belt in MMA. We better match him with this person. They don't care. They're not interested. It means nothing to, to anybody but you. But yeah, embrace it. Enjoy it. Like it. It means something to you because your coach has created a syllabus and they're rewarding you based on your, uh, where you're standing in that syllabus. Would it be fair to say then with the local competitions that rather than it being the pro MMA status, so you've got to fight a blue, that even if you have an amateur fight, you should be fighting a blue belt? You shouldn't be fighting jiu-jitsu if you're not. You shouldn't be fighting MMA if you're not a blue belt at uh, jiu-jitsu. Yeah, even at amateur level? Any level. Yeah. It's not like... Uh, if you... So, right, I comment it all the time and you'll hear me and people are probably fed up of hearing me say it. If you can't mount escape, you shouldn't be in an MMA fight. <laughs> What's the first thing you learn when you come through my door? Olympians mount escape. The Olympians mount escape, right? The first thing you learn, every single person you come through the door, you learn how to mount escape. Yeah. You should not be in an MMA fight if you cannot mount escape. If you cannot rear naked choke somebody, if you can't defend a rear naked choke, if you can't arm bar someone, if you can't defend an arm bar, if you can't defend an arm triangle, if you can't... Well, these are all common subs, right? What level are you if you can do all these things? Least the blue, a blue belt, realistically. Yeah. You shouldn't be in the cage if you're not a blue belt. If you're not a blue belt, you should not be in that cage. If you're in the cage and you haven't had your blue belt yet, you probably are a blue belt level. Your, your coach just hasn't given it to you. doesn't mean you're not a blue belt. You just, you know, like, you've not been given it. You're a blue belt level. But if you're not a blue belt level, your coach will be saying you're not ready for the cage yet. I had somebody, another coach, tried to convince me to get one of my fighters to go pro. Oh, we can match him at pro. He's had five, MM, uh, five amateur fights now. He's not in a career, he could go pro. I'm like, not a chance. No, I think he's ready. I was like, do you know what? He's never been on his back being ground and pound and he can't get out and I've had to coach him and he's listening to me like he's a robot and he's following all the instructions. I was like, when it goes to the ground, he's always on top dominating people. I was like, I need to see him under pressure and see how he comes back from that before he goes pro. Because when you're pro and you're on your back and you're being elbowed in the face, it's different a different story. game, right? Yeah. So next fight, this guy goes out, gets taken down, he pumps his back, gets in all sorts of trouble, gets flustered, gets, comes back and wins, gets flustered, gets stuck, can't get out, end of the round. I was like, dude, he's like, I just didn't know what the fuck to do. I just sort of froze. That's why he didn't go pro. Because it'd have been finished if it as a pro fight. You mm. know what I mean? You have to have the fundamentals of grappling. Don't go in there thinking, yeah, well, I'm a striker, I can bang people. Okay, same. When you're on your back, though, you ain't banging no one. Like, if you're not a decent blue belt, really, or you can't roll with decent, you shouldn't be in there. Yeah. You know, it's that simple. It's such a big part of the game, mate. Like, grappling is such a big part of the game. Yeah. I think to a lot of the jiu-jitsu guys, obviously, that I have spoken with have even said just the fact that there's elements of the MMA world which is completely new to them. So I think, uh, who was it? Dan Crocker was doing stuff with, I think it was Grant, I think it was, mm -hmm. and got him against the cage. Uh, Grant got him against the cage, and he was like, oh, I don't know what to do here right yeah. now. Next thing you know, his, his legs have been ripped out from underneath him, and he said he's just absolutely getting smashed all yeah. of a sudden. He said, I'm a, he said, obviously, I'm a brown belt. I'm a fucking ultra type of thing. I think I can hold my own, which is absolutely fine. We weren't even in the gear. I thought, oh, do you know I feel comfortable? He said, completely different world. I had yeah. no idea what the fuck I was doing type thing. Yeah, yeah like, I mean, we, we do wall work specific classes yeah. here, right? And p other fighters come from all places to come and do wall work stuff with me. And they're like, fuck, man, some of the stuff you show me, I'd never seen. And they're fight, they're actual fighters, you know? And they're like, they're like fucking hell, I didn't know how to stand up against it. And if you don't know how to stand up against the fence, you shouldn't be in the cage. Your coach is, you're an idiot. If you're letting your fighters fight and they can't mount escape or stand up against the cage, you shouldn't be letting them fight. It's that simple. These are basic things that you need to know, right? And there's so many great jiu-jitsu players out there now. Like, I mean, the other day, um, there was a fight. Uh, two people fought, actually. I commentated on Rage. One of them is a... Uh, uh, Lukasz Kutko, his name is, he's an amateur fighter, Polish guy, lost a few fights, lost a decision against John Watson, which I thought he should have won. John Watson thought he should have won it. And he fought, good stand-up, mate, he looked phenomenal on the ground. Phenomenal. And I was like, where has this come from? Like, he just, I'd never shown his jiu-jitsu off before. But his jiu-jitsu was phenomenal. And I'm like, see, this is the thing, you can go through so many fights losing in MMA with your jiu-jitsu never being shone, or never being seen, <laughs> yeah. but he's a very good jiu-jitsu player. However, 
you can come out in the guy's shoots when you absolutely dominate you with jujitsu because you never realised you had jujitsu. If you've got it and you need it, you've got you shouldn't be fighting if you haven't got a blue level, blue belt level of jujitsu. That's yeah. interesting. I think obviously again it's something for a lot of the other local comps to maybe consider when it comes to it, just because again, it just I think helps the disparity because I th I think there's probably a lot more less people who are well, it's probably more people going on the amateur MMA route at the moment and then actually jump into the pro thing. I think as times have gone on, as you kind of said, it is getting tough, right? In terms of going down the pro yeah. route, making a living out of it. And I think that jump is probably less and less more people doing it. I think there's some people out there who are doing it just for the sake of saying, hey, I've gone pro, right? Yeah, yeah, and there's, and there's very life, few yeah. people kind of going, hey, I've gone pro because this is what I want to do for the rest of my life type yeah, thing. Yeah. Like hearing obviously your story, it was pretty transparent that, hey, look, you're flying over to the States to do this as a full-time fucking thing for yourself. I don't think you hear that as often anymore. Well, I didn't care what people thought. I didn't care if people thought it was amazing or I didn't care if people thought it was crap because yeah. it means the same thing. Like if, you, if, you're gonna, if you're going to celebrate when people pat you on the back, if you feel happy when people say to you, mate, you're amazing, you're a wicked, you hit the hardest I've seen, you're the fastest, you're the strongest. If you're gonna think, yeah, that's amazing, you've got to also realize that people who slate you, their, their opinion counts as well. Because they both mean the same thing, fuck all. So if you're gonna celebrate when people are nice to you, you've got to also take on the criticism. Because people say, yeah, don't listen to them, it don't mean anything. Yeah, it does. It means the same as the people who think you're good. It's opinion, right? Yeah. You listen to one or the other. What actually matters is, what do you think, what your coach think? Now, if your coach is saying to you, listen, you're a fucking idiot. You're not training hard enough. You're going to go out there and lose. You don't put effort in. You're not training like a pro. You're not, and you're saying, oh, fuck him. Guys on Instagram think I'm good. You're a dickhead. Not your coach. You are. And the people on Instagram are. It's that simple. It's not, it's not rocket science. You work with people and the people who are criticizing you, you think, right, Who's criticising me? If it's my coach and my trainers and they're criticising me and saying I'm not working hard enough and I'm not training like a pro, I'm probably not then, am I? Right? If it's people on Instagram saying you're not training like a pro or not and they never come to your training sessions, it don't matter. It's like, it's like an old reel, wasn't it? It's like, oh, are you boxing lad 1933? Yeah. Like you said the fucking, uh, what was it? I can't remember which fighter they got. And they got one of them was like, oh, he couldn't fucking hit hard. What the fuck was this? You should have done it. And it was like, oh, all right, yeah, James, come on. And he's like, oh, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. And he just, he just smashes him straight in the style yeah. of a body shot. And it's just like, maybe you want to think next time you tweet something type yeah, thing type it stuff. Just, it mean, like, and it's the same for the people who think you're wicked. Like, oh, fair play, my boy. Nobody could stand with those hands. Hands, they can they can because he's in the gym and I've got eight stone guys beating him up like he might be 90 kilos and knocking people out in a fight in the gym he's getting it pulled over him because people train hard on him he can you're a mong who drinks at the pub and doesn't know anything about fighting your opinion counts to nothing if you want to celebrate that brilliant but celebrate when people say you're shit as well because they mean the same thing mm -hmm. nothing you know always reminds me of that good old phrase I think is um, lazy people think they've done enough um, even though they haven't, and the people who think that, and the hard workers are the people uh, who don't feel like they've done enough, even though they have. They have. That's exactly it, mate. Yeah. It's, I, I say this all the time to guys here. We got, we got a certain person here, um, and they say stuff, and I'm like, let me tell you something. I'm, I'll be honest with you now. I should be telling you to leave the gym, not telling you to come here. If I'm asking you to come to the gym, you don't want it. Like, when I own this gym, mate, I, Paul Reed would come in here and be like, mate, don't train tonight. I'm like, no, mate, no, I can't not. He's like, listen, you're fatigued. Do not fucking train. I was like, I'm just going to have a shadow box. He's like, no contact. And Paul would not let me train, right? Because we, we used to work with each other. We'd coach each other, right? Yeah. And listen, uh, I give Paul Reed loads of credit. My, my game wouldn't have been, my career wouldn't have gone where it had if it wasn't for him. And I'm sure his wouldn't have if it wasn't for me. That's how closely we work together. Yeah. We're a big part of each other. Now, he would have to stop me training. He'd message me, you haven't trained today, have you? I'm like, no, I haven't trained, mate. Good, you're having a day off today. And I'd listen, right? If, I am, if I'm not dragging you out the gym, I'm dragging you to the gym. You don't want this. Stop now. Stop. Do something else. You should not, a coach should not have to get you to come to the gym. It's that simple. You should not have to. You should be dragged out of the gym. If people are dragging you to the gym, if you're posting, yeah, massive cardio session today, blah, blah, blah. Fuck off. If your cardio's that hard, don't, you shouldn't be on there. Shut up. Get on with it. Put on there after if you want to, like, Val Card. I used to put on there, Val Cardio. Bosh, done. Wicked. Like, same. Put it on if you want to. But if people used to come on and say, like, fair play, mate, I wouldn't know because I'd never look at it again. Like, if people used to come on and say, like, that, like, when I post my podcast, I never look at the comments. <laughs> I don't know if you do. I don't. 
Like, if people interact with you me, lots of them don't get... look at. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't look at comments on my... Because once I put it out there, it's not my business. My mm. business was this conversation. Yeah. Once that's out there, what you think of it is not my business. I'll know, because my listeners will drop. Or they'll go up, right? Yeah. You don't need the constant pat on the back. If your coach is telling you you're shit, and all your mates at the pub are telling you you're great, one of them's right and one of them's wrong. <laughs> Definitely ones at the mouth. No, very much true. And I think the one person that always comes to mind when you look at that kind of setup of what you're talking about, again, Mark Hibbard, in that sense yeah. that he hates posting stuff on social media. But I know behind closed doors when speaking to him in person, every day is like two to three sessions, right? Yeah. Every single fucking day. Even if he hasn't got a comp in mind, every fucking day. He's a monster who works his ass yeah. off. There's All no choice. The time. Like, he's an absolute monster. He works his fucking ass off. It's that, that simple. There are, there's lots of people like him, but he's a standout, especially locally. He is an absolute standout. Yeah. He works his fucking ass off and he would go, like he came here and like I give him a, a bit of advice on a couple of things. He's willing to listen. He's willing to learn. He's not thinking, oh, I'm bigger and better than that and that. Like, He's an absolute standout right now yeah. um, because far. of his dedication. He will go far and he represents the South West really well. Yeah, I yeah. Think, for that whole represents his South well. Yeah. That's what he does. He's never shit-talking people. He's never do <laughs> He goes to the gym, he does his hard work, he teaches and he goes and represents himself. And that is all you yeah. can do. And, mate, there's parts of my career that haunt me and I was like, oh my God, it kills me that that happened. But I always trained Harder or as hard as my opponent. I made sure. I never undertrained. I always dedicated. Always committed. I was always professional. Always made weight. And I can always, no matter how shit some of my performances were, hold my head up and say, yeah, you know what? If you want to judge me by how much of an athlete I was, by whether I got a new UFC and if I was world champion, then I'll always be shit. If you want to judge me by the way I dedicated myself to the sport, I'll always be a world champion. Yeah. And that's mm. how it is, mate, you know? Right, well, we'll go on to some of the staple questions then, yeah, I think, which are really, really good. Um, which rule set within the grappling era do you think is going to elevate the sport even more? And I think the rule sets are going to go sub only, uh, IBJJF, um, or, oh, I've got IB, uh, EBI. Uh, let's see, just stop now if you want, we already know. <laughs> <laughs> sub only. Sub only. My only caveat would be I'd put that, like, so. If I put on a competition, yep. my rule set will be, um, you're at it first, I'm trademarking it now. My rule <laughs> set will be 10 minute with a five minute overtime, all scoring. Yep. Everything's scoring and you will be like 10 seconds to work from side control. I'll score your side control. If you've got side control and you've got your points for it, that's when you work. That's not, I've got my points for it, I hold him down now because I'm two <laughs> points up. That's when you work, you'll get a, you'll get a penalty for not for stalling. Yeah. I'm not, you're not stalling out two points with my rule set. So it'll be a 10 minute with a five minute overtime, all scoring. So yeah, that's that for me, sub only. Nice, sub -only. love that. Um, you get your dub, be that an MMA in a jiu-jitsu competition, whatever it is, you get that gold poet, go, got a good old gold medal, uh, which is obviously five pound as we all know. Yeah. <laughs> um, what is the post comp meal you're going for? For me, yeah, um, it's hard. Like, like I eat pretty good even when I'm naughty. Apart from like <laughs> I do, like I love an Indian or something. Do you know what I mean? Like probably though would be pizza. Like what are we ordering pizza wise? Oh, double pepperoni and pineapple with black olives. Oh, pineapple does pineapple on pizza. pizza. Yeah, of course, mate. yeah. Sure. Um, I would and I'd probably try and go to an Italian restaurant for it rather than Domino's or some shit like that. I'd go and get one of the thin ones yeah. from an Italian restaurant. It's yeah. really big. Um, it's probably. I mean, I prefer lots of food. I prefer to. To that. Like I love a steak and chips, and I love a pie and chips, and I love an Indian, a Chinese. If we order seven different things and have a bit of everything, <laughs> but there's nothing more rewarding than a pizza. I don't think yeah. pizza and Ben and Jerry's for afterwards, maybe. Quick question on the pizza front. Now I think this is taking me a few years to realize this. A good quality pizza has a crusty bottom, right? Yeah. You don't want it like super soft, like hanging off. Yeah. Like you, your ingredients with that it's as well. Stung baked, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. Ah, perfect. Absolutely yeah. amazing. I think one is. Uh, is it? Bella Vista. Yeah. Do you know where that is by any chance? Bella, that's not the one in Bennett's, is it? No, Bella Vista. No. So this is the one by Castle Park across the bridge. Oh, I know it. Yeah, I know where you Fucking mean. Fucking incredible, mate. Like, always rammed in there. So right. there's a place called um, Lostaria, is it called? Lostaria. Lostaria. Yeah. Their pizza. I've got to get it delivered to work, mate. They're huge. <laughs> they are, yeah. Super thin. Yeah. Um, 
I like theirs. I like it thin like that, crispy, thin. Like you can snap it, whereas like people, they're a great pizza. Italian pizzas like that, you know, from a yeah, restaurant. Exactly yeah, exactly that. The only thing I found with Osteria is sometimes it depends on how many toppings you have. You've got to add some more like tomato-based sauce with it because sometimes yeah. the they're a little bit dry. So Bella Vista, you think, yeah? Honestly, mate, fantastic. Tomorrow mate. night, I'll probably get one then. <laughs> Do it. Okay. Um, okay, what's an unpopular grappling... I normally say jujitsu opinion, but we'll say grappling. What's an unpopular grappling opinion that you have? Oh, uh, it's probably the quietest has been all podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, um, I, I, I would probably say takedowns are as valuable as submissions really like, or submission attempts like they didn't finish the fight but a solid takedown is as hard to get as a fucking hard submission sometimes so i think if you that takedowns aren't valued enough i think probably is probably the number one yeah and especially if you get frozen nogi like <laughs> nogi frozen stuff like stuff like, that's probably about it like i'm not really very controversial because i accept that everything's its own yeah thing i also think as well is uh you should be allowed to be graded just for no gi. You okay. shouldn't, like, I, all these people who say, oh, you need to do gi to get graded, I think that's nonsense as well. So I think you can be a black belt and not be in the gi. Sure. Um, but also I think, yeah, I think takedowns are, are undervalued. Takedowns are undervalued. Yeah. Cool, I like that. That's if they cool. were valued more, I think people would stand up more. That's true. Yeah. So what yeah. point systems would you give for it? Um, um, I don't... Uh, I don't really know. It'd be high. Like, I mean, the thing is, like, you get things like, what'd you get? Three or four for a fucking mount? Uh, mount, you get three. Three, so you get three for a takedown then. It's, for me, like, you get high level, four maybe for a takedown. High, do you know what I mean? Really high, high as you can. Yeah. Give it high, as high as you can score it. Takedowns. Um, yeah, I think takedowns score, need to score really highly. Really, really highly. That's interesting. Yeah. Would you put that in your, in your own comp rule set then? Yeah, it's, uh, possibly, yeah. I mean, it'd be no, there'd be no scoring until the last round, but probably, yeah, a takedown would be a dis So for me, it's also like in MMA, this is what, uh, in MMA side of things, stand-up should score as high as takedowns. Mm. So if you take me down in MMA and I get to the fence and I stand back up, you, that should score as highly as a takedown. You're take, not scoring me points for it, your takedown's void. Yeah. Because it's harder to get up than it is to take someone down. That's the same technically from, uh, you go for a takedown, you get guillotined. Like, you yep. don't get the points until the guillotine's taken off basically so they've yeah. got out of the submission in terms yeah 100 percent. yeah that's 100 percent right yeah yeah definitely yeah that's interesting cool um obviously we've got the do you want your mystery question first or the staple question first whichever mate i'm good all right i'll leave the uh mystery questions okay. to the end so i think it's good so the staple question that we've got for you which failure in grappling or life do you cherish the most um so my failure in my career let's say uh, would be MMA. There's only one thing that doesn't haunt me, but there's one thing where I had the opportunity to really show who I was and I really didn't show up. Now, I've admitted that I think I had some psychological issues with my fighting and that I never got nervous. Like, I would go into a fight. You Sometimes I'd be like planning my shopping and stuff. <laughs> yeah. I mean, led there and someone's going for a submission. I'm like, oh, tomorrow I'm going to get a French stick and put garlic butter on it. And I'd be, look, as I'm fighting, now the one loss for me where... And I'll tell you what stands out so much. Uh, Kurt Warburton, main event on Cage Warriors. I'd trained a lot with Tim Newman for that fight. Tim Newman had fought him before. And Tim Newman was like, mate, you're going to knock him out. He said, I, you're boxing. He said, you're boxing me all over the place. He said, and I was boxing him all over the place. He said, you'll knock him out 100%. He said, when you hit him with that right hand. And then when I turned up, I had a game plan in my head. And I just stuck to that so strictly for a jab when he wasn't even in position is so that's the one where I was like I really had a chance there to show who I was and I didn't so that one's the one where I thought if I could run it back I'd do that one um, all the others don't give a fuck I lost so what like listen that was my fight career like that's how it was I mean like I train with enough people so they know how good I am or how good I'm not don't care what people's opinions are don't care where you rank me like I'm just is what it is um but that that bothers me. Kurt Warburton fight bothers me. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd like to. I'd like to have redone that one. That that bothered me. Um, failures in life. Uh, I none. I love it, man. I like so. 
look, I did some stand up, I've done some stand up comedy yeah. and stuff. And like, Aren't you worried that you're gonna, no one's gonna laugh? I'm like, no, I want to, I want to bomb. And they're like, what? I'm like, the highest high is people laughing at your jokes. So if you tell one joke and somebody laughs, you don't get any better than that. Yeah. Other than they laugh at all of your jokes, right? So the highest high is people laugh at your jokes. Well, I've had that. Like, I've got video evidence of that. Dick energy. Yeah, I've got video evidence of people <laughs> laughing at my jokes. The lowest low is nobody laughs at none of your jokes. There's tumbleweed. It's awkward. How amazing would that be to feel that? Like, the <laughs> awkwardness, the cringe, the hurt. Like, I can't imagine what it feels like to bomb that badly. So, like, yeah, I'd like to experience the lowest of the lows and the highest of the highs of that. Like, yeah, but I don't think... I don't, I don't know that I've had any failures. I've had things that I haven't won at and I've had is losses. Any, is there any, any failures that you think you've learned a lot from other than that fight, do you feel? Yeah, loads. I mean, like... All sorts of failures, failures in relationships, failures yeah. with work, um, failures, like all, all sorts of failures, mate, um, that I've learned loads from, like paragliding, like just stuff with paragliding, like certain bits with, I think the reason I do quite well at paragliding is because I don't, I won't quit. There's no quitting me. Like I'll work. Uh, so if some, if a bit of air is going up at yeah. like 0 0.1, yeah. And you're like 500 feet above the ground. You're nearly on the deck. It's all over. And that 0.1, that could take you maybe an hour and a half to climb to cloud base. Well, people will get sick of it. They're fucking fed up of it. Do you know what I mean? Like, if you're going to four meter second climb, you'll be up there in like 15 minutes. I'll sit and I'll work it. And I'll mince it. And I'll have it. Not because I want to, like, I just don't want to quit. I'm not, I'm not going to fucking quit. You're going to fucking quit on yourself. Fuck that. I'm not Everyone listening quit. and watching this, uh, you definitely see it in the group chat randomly. Like, all of a sudden, like, can anyone pick me from here? <laughs> all yeah. of a sudden. And I'm like, where the fuck has he got there? All of a sudden, it's yeah. obviously where you've gone. Yeah. With fucking so gliding. I just think that, like, yeah, I don't, I'm not, like, I'm not somebody who looks at life of, as having failures, and that's not an ego thing. I just think, like, it's just, it's just a series of, ex like, the jujitsu, there's no jujitsu failures. No. Because, there's only a failure if that's the end. Mm. Like, if you, if I roll tonight and I get subbed by a blue belt, I haven't failed. Like, we go again the next day, don't yeah, we? Yeah. We start again. The timer starts again. We go again. Like, yep. unless somebody says, right, if this person subs you, you can never do jujitsu again. Like, there are no failures in life. It's just a, a just keep gathering experiences, putting them all together, and hopefully you piece something out of it at the end where you lay back and you think, that was all right, and you smile and you die. Like, that's like... That's well, it. That's um, success. There's no win. No one's winning this shit. I'm the immortal one. I'm not getting out of this shit in life. <laughs> like nobody's winning at this. No matter how you, no matter what you do in life, nobody's winning it. Well, it kind of moves on finally to the mystery question, okay. which I think is really wicked on this one. Once it's all said and done for you, mate, how do you want to be remembered? Funny. Like uh, I think if people like, I say this like a girl, a girl. Uh, before I said like, on the door and school, yeah you're ugly I'm like I let people punch this for 20 years being pretty was never a priority <laughs> I'm never worried about being pr pretty um, I'd like to be remembered as being funny like people said like, oh Wes was funny Wes is the sort of person if we went out for Wes oh he wouldn't stop talking his stories were funny and you always would have a laugh like, if I was feeling down Wes, Wes would crack some jokes it'd be funny that I think um, honourable and uh, respectful as well like I think people can Lots of people don't like me. I can be a contrasting figure. I get that. And you're not meant to be liked by everybody. And guess what? I don't fucking like all of you as well. <laughs> but I, people, I don't think anybody would ever say, oh, that Wes, he tried to have me over. Oh, that Wes, he told my student this. I think honourable. Like, I'm honourable. Like, you know, like, people come here and they say, like, oh, I want to come here. I haven't told my coach. You don't step on my mats then, you know, like, stuff like that within this sport. But also within life, like... yeah. I just I like to be remembered as being honourable and moral. Like I say to people all the time, I don't relinquish my morals for anybody. You know, funny, horrible, and respected, basically. Well, well not respected, respectful. respectful. Yeah, 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 that's, yeah, the, one. Yeah, that's yeah. the one. Mate, nice one. I think that was really fucking awesome in terms of that. Thanks, obviously, for coming on. Like I said, I think you, I, what, you've been on my hit list for a while. To be honest, <laughs> like I said, because you've been involved with multiple people within Bristol and the surrounding areas in terms of their ability of grappling, MMA, whatever you want to label it as type of thing. And you're big, obviously, influencing, I think, on everyone in some sort of way or another. Um, so, yeah, just thanks for coming on, mate, and thanks for your time. Really do appreciate it. So, Oh, mate, honestly, thank you for having me. I know I probably went on longer than most people's, but that's the consequence of my, <laughs> I'm a talker. But, no, I had, great, I had great fun, mate. And like I said, you're a valued part of the team. So thanks very much for it. Nah, appreciate it. Cheers, brother.
Right, I need a quick eh? Press stop recording.